seat and we will soon begin this conference. Right. It is such a pleasure to welcome all of you to the EB's annual conference, boosting the deal for a greener Europe in turbulent times. My name is Johanna Sandahl and I am the president of the EB, Europe's largest network of environmental citizens organizations with 180 member organizations with a common vision a better future where people and nature thrive together. We live in turbulent times. When we thought everything would go back to normal again after the COVID-19 pandemic, Russia's unacceptable attack on Ukraine turned everything upside down. We now have a situation with a war bringing human suffering, death and destruction to Europe on a horrifying scale and a new context for political decision-making has been established. At the same time, we need to put, put full attention to the triple planetary crisis, the three main interlinked issues that humanity currently faces, climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss. The European Green Deal is the EU's key instrument to deal with this crisis and as we approach the midpoint of the EU's five-year cycle, it is a good moment to reflect upon where the European Green Deal has succeeded in making positive change, where results have been mixed and where it has simply been disappointing. And this conference will offer that opportunity. In today's first session with Luc Bass from EEA and Patrick Trembling from the EB, we will get insights about how the EU is faring with respect to the main environmental crisis. What has been achieved so far and what policy action is still needed for the European Green Deal to be sufficiently transformative. There are, as many of us know in this room, many compelling reasons to accelerate the green transition. And lately, the terrible war in Ukraine has been added to the list. But geopolitical factors may as well put the brake on Europe's environmental ambitions. In session two, a distinguished group of stakeholders will discuss whether geopolitics are knocking Europe's green ambitions off course or whether they will actually speed them up. To deal with the environmental crisis and challenges, policy action is needed in a number of policy fields. And in the third session of today's conference, we will, in breakout groups, go into greater depth in evaluating the success or failure of the European Green Deal. And while transformative policies are absolutely key, it is also necessary to mobilize a whole of society transition to living within the planetary boundaries. So in session four, another thing, uh, distinguished group of stakeholders will discuss what has to be done to ensure that the Green Deal is the credible transformative agenda that is so urgently needed. Europe and the rest of the world is in a transition period, and so is the EEB. 
As most of you probably know, this is our Secretary General Jeremy Waits' last annual conference, and he will, on the 1st of July, be replaced by our new Secretary General, probably known to many of you, our current Deputy Secretary General, Patrick uh, Tambrink. And Jeremy has been the Secretary General for 11 years, and in the final session of, of today, we will have the pleasure to listen to his thoughts uh, about successes and failures of the past, as well as challenges for the future. And throughout the conference today, there will be different polls and questions in Slido. And to access that, as well as when you write your tweets, use the hashtag EEB22. So again, a warm welcome to all of you. And now, before we move into session one, I have the pleasure to introduce Andrei Andrusovic from uh, Society and Environment in Ukraine. And you are also our Ukrainian EB board member. And uh, he will speak about building a greener future from the ashes of war. And I'm sure that you can imagine that it's not been easy for Andre to join us here today, but we are truly delighted that you've been able to do so. Andre, please. Indeed, it was hard to get here. And the fact I am here is just because absolutely serious in my country wants me to be here and speak to you. Um, dear colleagues, friends, dear EB family, it is my privilege to uh, address you today. I first want you to thank you for every message of support you sent, every statement of support you made, or and every decision of support you took, and every hug you gave. This is what helps us to resist and go on with no sense of overstatement. You are about to discuss the ways to build a, a greener Europe in turbulent times. Turbulent times for Ukraine means a full-scale Russian aggression, a war that our generation has never experienced and been ready for. Can one be ready for a war? You wake up one day from a raid siren and all your plans are gone. All your projects are gone or suspended. Your family, your colleagues, your um, friends, they take hard decisions. Stay or leave. The nature has no option. It stays, and it suffers from explosions, from crunches, from mines, from all kinds of spills. The, the war has a colossal impact on the nature and on the environmental community. Just to give you a small sense of, of the scale of this, we have regular reports that one platoon defense point which is a 400 meters front line, 400 meters, could be hit 2,000 times per day by artillery. And we have a front line, an active front line, of over 1,000 kilometers. This is a huge impact, a daily impact on everything. War has no walls, we know from Ukraine, we know that it has, it brought direct implications from the European Green Deal, for the European Green Deal implementation. Uh, sustainability now goes hand in hand with security. The peace we all want will never mean the same and will never be taken for granted. With this I'm referring to the huge military spendings we all are witnessing and expecting. We Ukrainians, we know that we will win. We know that we will also need to rebuild the country, rebuild it better, rebuild it in a green way. 
we will need to restore the nature. Those scars will remain. I truly hope the Ukraine will get the EU candidate status in the coming days. This will be a game changer for us. As I said, to rebuild better. We are rebuilding already the country as the war goes on, to restore the nature. We count on you to ensure that the EU money, the EU support money, will be spent on green conditions, even at the time of the war. Listen to Ukraine. Don't stay within the same frames that led us to these turbulent times. Europe can be stronger and greener with Ukraine if we are given a chance. We are anyway on the same ship, which is called Europe. And together, I'm sure we will find the ways to build a greener Europe. You are here, the strongest and the most influential environmentalist in Europe. You have the determination, you have the knowledge. You are the ambassadors of nature. And I truly hope you'll be the ambassadors of Ukraine too. Again, every message of support, every statement of support, every word of support counts. I wish you productive discussions. Slava Ukraini. Thank you so much, Andre. Um, and on behalf of the, this whole room, I think I can express how deeply upset uh, I am about what's going on right now. Th thank you so much. And um, there is, as you say, <coughs> very strong support of solidarity with you and the Ukrainian population. And um, but of course, it's, it's easier to be in, in Stockholm and Brussels and just express your support. So that's why I think it's so important that we also discuss the issue about how to practically support you. It's, it's very, very important. And <clears throat> this conference is one opportunity, and perhaps particularly in one of the breakout groups today, <coughs> which is beyond the EU supporting green ambition in the wider world. But thank you so much, Andre. Really appreciate that you made it here. Thank you. All right, um, so now let's move into the first session of this conference. And I would like to invite our first two speakers. Lukvas, welcome. Uh, head of uh, Coordination Networks and Strategy at um, EEA. And uh, Luke is no stranger to many of you here in Brussels as a previous European Regional Director at the IUCN. And Patrick Tenbrink, currently our Deputy Secretary General and EU Policy Director. And from the two of you today, we will hear about science and policy and how Europe is doing. And Luke will start by presenting the state of the environment and Patrick will follow to talk about the EB's midterm review of the European Green Deal. Look, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Johanna. And I must say, um, I've never been challenged more to start speaking at a conference. And it's obviously to do with what we just heard from um, Anjay. And um, I just wanted to, before I kick off, to emphasize that First of all, I find it incredible that you, even in these times, are really focusing on thinking on the recovery and then leapfrogging what many of us here in the West, if you have to call it the West, have been doing wrong for decades. So and that's, that's unbelievable. The second thing, it's difficult to go now into, what's it, let's say, the business of the European Green Deal without reflecting to it, and there will be a session later. 
But I also wanted to emphasize that the EEA, in the coordination with the European Commission, will do what we can to support, especially on, on, on knowing and monitoring and our knowledge that, that can help. Uh, I also know um, as the uh, accession uh, is an issue new on the table that there is also a discussion, um, and that's a logical consequence from that discussion, um, to see uh, how Ukraine and, and maybe some other partners in the neighborhood in the East could become also cooperating partners of, of the EA, because as you know, we have countries in the network that are not only EU countries. But I wanted to, to just say that before I, I kick off. Um, and then take a deep breath, because it's difficult to go into that in a presentation where this is, of course, um, among us. And we go to what we all know, and I think I will try to go through these first slides quickly, because I don't have to convince the audience here about the urgency, about the challenge, about the needs, about the fact that we're doing a lot, but so far away from what we should be doing. And it's just a sense of urgency. And those first slides are not to convince you, but maybe you can take away messages to convince those that for some reason still are not convinced. So you can, you can use that. Um, these are only some explanations about the climate hazards that are coming at us. But in principle, these are the hazards that are on top of already existing hazards also from from other sources, from, from pollution, as we said before, and of course from the deterioration of nature and, and us not stepping up to, to go faster. So the, the climate effects or the climate hazards are actually on top of, of many other environment hazards and hopefully we will get better also at finding synergies uh, and also explaining the trade-offs, uh, but they will be important. Eh? These are, as I said, these are vulnerability, these long-term risks to health and direct risks to health and this is then focus on climate change, but there's a lot of underlying challenge. A reminder from the State of Environment report that the agency has uh, pr produces every five years. Um, again, th this speaks for itself. You must have seen it quite a few times. Uh, we do make some progress, uh, and that's positive, but it is still marginal if compared to what is going to be needed, especially when we look at the trajectory to 2050 on climate change, for example. And we see also that it's especially in the natural capital part that we are in the red. So I'm not saying this because I was a former uh, director for ICN, but because it's just in the reports, it is where we seem to be uh, in an extra challenge to deal with it. And just to say, and you will discuss it this afternoon, with the war in Ukraine and the effects that are some by some considered, uh, uh, there is a lot of yeah, wrong information as well that is being used now to even push down the nature agenda uh, in Europe. And that is, that is of concern. So we have to have that knowledge and that argumentation and a good communication to just uh, rebut that. And this, of course, is an incredibly strong statement from the president of the commission in 2019, which, uh, of course, plays into uh, the work we do there and the biodiversity strategy. Um, I'm sure that next speakers will allude to it. We are all uh, very hopeful, and it was confirmed, I think, by the commissioner that the nature restoration law will be on the table next week, uh, Wednesday, I believe. But then I think the real discussion and the tough discussions will start about that. And the same is still to go, I think, for the, for the opportunity sharing, I always call it, of the, of the protection, protected area target. So one part, I will not do the assessment of the Green Deal because there is a great assessment by the EEB, so the EEA goes first, alphabetically, I guess, uh, to, t to talk about a little bit going further and on a transition uh, path as well, so because to, uh, to maybe illuminate how important it is to go faster now and go out of the red uh, traffic lights that you have identified, because we have to really go fast to make sure that the 2050, is, which is much closer than we may think, can be reached. Um, this is for completeness. Again, I won't go too long because I do hope you all know this. These are all these information systems. These are the ones that are closely related to nature and biodiversity and health, of course. We always make that nexus. Uh, you know of our famous air pollution charts um, that point to the uh, health nexus. One 
thing I wanted to emphasize today as well, because it's about the knowledge, and sometimes there is even too much knowledge or too much information, and we get lost in information. Some advocate even for more and more information, and at some point, it's about using the information, of course. This new uh, land monitoring service and the EA has a, has a big contract to execute this is um, going to be very interesting in all the reports that uh, we produce because they are obviously based on national data um, and what we receive from the countries. Um, but it will be good to compare it to what Copernicus will tell us. And it is immense, huh? the amount of information that we get from only from this one uh, initiative and there will be more, it's still growing is immense, but there will also be a point where there will also no, be no discussion about the reality. Um, so that is a real big prospect uh, for the next years. Also for completeness, and I think it's also a bit in the context of what I said earlier, these are the countries. Um, of course, deplorably, we have lost one, a very important one, um, but we have also these cooperating partners in the Western Balkans that uh, I think are really knocking on the door, especially also in the, in the context that we are in to become full members. We are not involved in that direct process because it's a political process, but we support them technically. And of course, um, you can see that there are many non-EU countries there as well. I'm emphasizing this because the agency is only 240 people. Eh? We are tiny compared to some national agencies. We have to be very modest about that. But the network is immense. It's thousands of experts and, and a whole network of different, what we then call IONET. Eh? Uh, groups that work on different issues. So it's, it's immense and we sometimes have a challenge to, to be able to digest even what comes from there, not just the data but also all the knowledge and the solutions which are often national. The graph, again, uh, a reminder but also to just realize the immensity um, of what we have to achieve in 2050. That means that only already alone in this graph and this graph should show that there is no time to waste also on the biodiversity and the nature agenda because it will be about the mitigation part without diluting on the, on the, uh, the, the, the hard emissions, but also for the resilience. So it's quite inexplicable that it's difficult to get the funding in, the pl in place for nature and biodiversity at the level needed when you know that it is so a double whammy. Some people say it's a triple whammy. It's health, it's resilience, it's mitigation. It's so much. And still, it doesn't uh, seem to happen. But these are the projections. This is the reality. Um, and just maybe one example is that the, 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 the little crunch we had on CO2 emissions through COVID, well, it's not so little, actually. It was, it was quite considerable. It is this, this famous 6%. We will have to do that in a double fashion, so double as much as reduction as in the slowdown of the economy with COVID, to reach the targets just to give you a bit of an, of an idea of what, what the real challenge is. Actually, two and a half. It's even more difficult. Um, one update for those that haven't spotted it, and that's, it's positive, I think, that this is now being uh, um, launched. It's a result from the uh, climate law that there is a scientific advisory board on climate change, and it has just kicked off. Uh, Three, uh, two months ago, uh, it was uh, fully established, and there is a chair, Otmar Edenhofer, uh, who is chairing this, this panel. This is not an EEA uh, advisory board. We host it and we provide the secretariat, but it's a fully and obviously independent uh, advisory board. And this is the advisory board that will advise, for example, on the, on the 2040 target. Uh, and we will have it scientifically and robust with this great panel, this great board. This is just, again, to showcase um, this kind of real data, real data to see how with the air quality in city, it, climate effort and energy efficiency and all these other things will be in synergy. So we have to just showcase this very clearly. The zero pollution agenda, just in the wrap up here, um, holds a lot of opportunities uh, and we are progressing. Uh, we are progressing, um, but we're very far from that zero, we have to be honest. Um, and it will come to what I will say later is that it's really more structural, more systemic. Uh, we are scratching an important surface, but it's still a surface. And it has to be more fundamental on the consumption and production context on our systems and to make a start with it. 
Um, another part that is important in what we also document, and we work with another agency, uh, the Eurofound agency, that looks at the social impact and the social matters. So we have this collaboration with other agencies to make sure that the social component in what the agency does contributes also to, uh, to the agenda. And I think it's one of these elements that will have to be also very strong in the future. And you can see that it is geographically spread. It has a lot of uh, background uh, on the social reality in, in parts of Europe. So, no quick fixes, that's clear. We have to look at the systems. It's really a systems approach. In our next State of the Environment report, we will even do this more to look at the system approach. And of course, it's not just happening here in Europe. It is a huge responsibility to also look much more and much better and much more honest <laughs> and with much more uh, numbers. And we hear more and more calls, not just from, from civil society, but also from, from some governments in, uh, and some member states to look also further and much more beyond the borders uh, on our systems and what our, the effect is on that. A transitions logic is what is needed. There is a model that we have been working on. So apart from all the, the let's say, the hardcore work, which is a big two-thirds of the work of the agency is supporting the legislation, supporting the monitoring, uh, but we also need and want to focus and uh, collect the knowledge that often exists already and bring it together and have this trend kind of transition logic to, to look at. Again, a slide we could discuss for 10 minutes, minutes or even longer, I won't, it's just to give an inspiration and of course to connect the dots between science and policy here. Um, and then just to quickly go through this curve, and I'm looking next to me, so I'm going to try to wrap up with this uh, X curve. We have to move in the right direction and we have to move away from the wrong direction. And that is where sometimes the conflicts start to exist. Um, if we don't look at it in, in, in a way of moving away and moving forward at the same time, it's not gonna work. It's about scaling up. And of course, all these examples on, on how we have to deal with what is still unbelievably negative um, in our approach is really detrimental. Integrated knowledge, incredibly important, but the knowledge that we often have is actually not translating really in the policy. And I needed to show this slide because it is not the agency, agency that said that the greening of the cap is inefficient. It's many other institutions uh, that know that that is the case and that we have to ramp up, especially when it is such an important part of the instrument uh, to do better and to integrate in Europe. The elephant, you know, I will not go too long on it, but we need to change the narrative and need to dare to bring uh, issues on the table in, uh, that are uncomfortable in places that would find them uncomfortable. And to finally give you some inspiration, what we think is and could hope to be learning from what we're doing now, there's still a lot of implementation needed on the Green Deal that will be discussed later, but it is very much looking at social dimension, longer time horizon, real integration, and the agency uh, is ready to help with that. Thanks. <laughs> Just in time. Thank you very much. And Patrick, the floor is yours. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm here to talk about the midterm assessment of the Green Deal, which you have in your packs. Um, and I'll sort of introduce some of the aspects. I won't go into all the details because also in the uh, breakout sessions, we'll explore in depth. So if I'm... Okay, so let's start. I mean, Ursula von der Leyen was elected on the 16th of July 2019 with the European Green Deal as her priority. And she was voted in the parliament narrowly to have her place because of her agenda and her commitment. And just to, re just to remind people, our goal is to reconcile the economy with the planet, to reconcile the way we produce, the way we consume, with our planet and to make it work for our people. This is Europe's man in the moon moment. So I think this is just a reminder, and you'll remember the man in the moon, which will transfer into a person in the moon by the end of the presentation. So a content. We had the political declaration. After that came the communication. After that, there's the work program. And then file by file, it's rolled out month by month. So the Green Deal is not just the political declaration. It's the whole lot. A lot of the legislative files will face debate in the Council and Parliament. So while we assess the files now, most of them in the state of where they came out of the Commission, the final results will depend on the rest of the process. 
As we heard, the Green Deal was under attack in the COVID crisis. We didn't know whether it would survive. It came out. People from across the, Europe and the institutions and all of us made an effort to, survive, uh, to save it. And the Green Deal became the blueprint for the recovery in many ways. The Russian war in Ukraine, and thanks again, Andre, is being instrumentalized. So turning a, a terrible situation even worse and offering false solutions, which is basically uh, a shame and shameful. But finally, the transformative potential depends on the institutions, but also on implementation. Oops, going the wrong way. Fine, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna assess, is it good, is it mixed or missed opportunity and bad? And we try to put them in different categories, but of course, every law is quite complex, and in reality, every law will have a bit of good, a bit of missed opportunity, a bit of bad. So just on the good bits, let's start with the good bits, it's always useful here. We have the climate neutral, uh, Europe commitment into the climate law for Europe. Okay, it's not in the member states, but it's for Europe. We have the social climate fund, which is exciting and important because the social dimension is fu fundamentally embraced. We have a danger in terms of a commitment to get rid of the sales of cars, of, pet of fossil fuel cars under that law. The biodiversity strategy, again, a fantastic piece of work, a commitment to the nature restoration law. The soil strategy, a good promising a soil health law. The Zero Pollution Action Plan is a game changer in terms of a commitment to the preventative approach and a commitment to zero pollution. The chemical strategy is a commitment to zero harmful chemicals over time. The circle economy is to make sure all actual products are safe that we have, and that's not the case now. The Environmental Crime Directive tries to tighten the rules um, and the fines. The Just Transition tries to think about communities and how we can actually ensure they're part of the transition. All of us were here during the Juncker Commission and Barossa before, none of this was possible. So we need to first applaud the Commission and its representative here, Florica von Teuer, for this. This is amazing. However, there's also a series of missed opportunities. The farm to fork strategy misses aspects. The, the forest strategy, the fit for 55 package, it's only pushing for 1.5 degrees. Uh, sorry, only pushing for minus 55, which is not enough for 1.5 degrees. The ZPAP, the missed out on environmental noise, missed out on light pollution. The methane strategy, the missed out on agricultural emissions was weak on waste. The waste shipment regulation also had weaknesses. It doesn't focus on plastic exports to third countries. Then to keep going, the industrial emissions directive is, is good in many ways, but it misses the opportunity to actually integrate climate concerns in the, in the legislation. The EPRTR misses the opportunity of good transparent information across the area. The Recovery and Resilience Fund and, and, and wider misses a range of opportunities for, for the transition and really address the core drivers of the loss. In the National Recovery and Resilience Plans, a lot of member states miss the opportunity to commit to policy reforms that are essential for the way forward. The taxonomy has been good in many parts, but a travesty. Then the Corporate Sustainable Due Diligence Directive, good step forward, but loopholes. Gender mainstreaming, good commitments, but the files don't walk the talk. And finally, green growth strategy and well-being. There's been some progress on well-being, BAP, but formally that's outside the Green Deal, and still it's growth, 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 and as you heard from the last presenter, that's not gonna be enough. So then let's go to the bad and depress ourselves a little bit. Celebrate the good but the bad. The common agricultural policy still pushes for intensive agriculture, despite all the evidence of the problems. There is a little bit of a silver lining in that there is, there's positive move on some of the eco schemes, but this is small. Gas nuclear and the taxonomy and biomass in the pre previous Climate Delegated Act shows that this process, which is supposed to be there as an evidence-based thing, has been basically ambushed by political interests. Better regulation commitment as, as, at core is the one-in-one-out principle, which is not really good regulation. It's unfortunately a political fix, and it puts a break on something. Of course, we hope that this is just on paper, but we need to work together to avoid it happening in practice. The risk of deregulation, the Repower EU package, in many ways, fantastic package pushing forward a real commitment to renewables, but it actually opens the door for deregulation. And if it opens the door for deregulation here on national interests, uh, then, it may, then it may actually open the door elsewhere. For example, why not mining? Why not lithium mining being exempt? Because we need it for our cars. So we need to be super careful. Again, material strategy, then institutional capacity, and the DG environment has only had like a 1% increase in the budget, despite having like probably a 500% increase in workload. So 
Also, we need to take our hats off to the to DG environment for the, for the hours that's been worked. There's issues of institutional man, uh, uh, mandates and enforcement and so on. So I'll leave that to that. So in summary, we actually have a good transformative narrative. Okay, just to remind us, we ended on the reds, but we started on the greens. It's got a very good transformative narrative. The strategies are good, the long-term objectives and the commitments, we should applaud that. But it's weaker on the pace of change. It's on the level of constraints, and whenever money or the costs come into account, it's weaker. When it hurts, it's weakened. And the progressiveness of legislation is mixed. So that there are threats also by weakening deregulation, conflicting objectives. And finally, just to remind where I started, the assessment will evolve with the Council and Parliament's impacts. The Council and Parliament can have a massive impact. So it's really beholden of all of us to engage with the Council and the Parliament to make sure it's as good as it can be. And the delivery is essential for public trust. It's about the environment, but it's also public trust, EU institutions, and a fair future. And for my final slide, it, will this be EU's person on the moon moments? And this is important. We have a slider question on this, but we won't show. And the ambition is the quantity and the quality of these files. Will it escape the gravitational pull of the status quo? That depends on whether we resist business and political ideological lobbying. We need the right compass. We need system change, as Luke said. We need to listen to youth's voices. We need ethics at the heart of science as a foundation. If we have too many pilots at the controls, then we won't get there. So we need to avoid policy dissonance. We really need to ensure coherence. And we also, of course, don't want to miss the launch window. If the files, the files have to navigate the Council and Parliament, if they're delayed, they won't get through. So this is the REACH and CLP. There's concerns about that. We need to get them done on time so they can be agreed by the end of this Council and uh, this, this Commission President. Finally, the Green Deal cannot be allowed to goals, get the timing right and the compass. And with that, thank you. We are moving on to the next session, and I would like to welcome Patricia Heidegger, the EB Director of Global Policies and Sustainability, and also, what very few of you know, Patricia will. and you can ask questions online and we'll pick them up later on in the session. So as we've heard now um, this morning, the European Green Deal has promised to deliver a set of deeply transformative policies. It's meant to guarantee and that we can prevent the environmental and climate crises from to accelerate the transition. War has been used, as we've already heard, by many powerful interest groups, also as an excuse to undermine our, our ambitions. We're not alone in the race to decarbonization. The race to decarbonization, um, it's opportunist or put the brakes on our own ambitions here in Europe. The US has reappeared in high carbon technologies all around the world, including in our own region. Um, India, um, has seen rapid um, growth, um, is now the third um, emitters after, af emitter after China and the US, just to name a few. New fossil fuel extraction projects are still increasing environmental and social pressures. Um, a paradox in light of uh, our, our objective to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. At the same time, the scramble for um, critical raw materials has just started. Um, it comes with new threats and new pressures for people and nature. So how can we ensure energy independence? How can we ensure sufficiency regarding raw materials? How can we ensure the restoration of our biodiversity and ecosystems and ensure basic needs while becoming a real partner to other parts in the world? These are the big questions we are asking ourselves this morning um, with um, a distinguished panel. Um, so we will start with a video message, a recorded video message from Pascal Canfin, the chair of the Environment Committee in the Europe. Jan Dusik, he's the deputy minister um, in the Czech Environment Ministry. Um, we have Petros Kokalis, member of the European Parliament in the Environment Committee. We have with us uh, Florica fink -Hoyer. she's the director general and DG Environment. Um, welcome to all of you this morning. towards carbon neutrality, energy independence, zero pollution, sustainable food systems and biodiversity restoration. How are we ensuring that Europe becomes and stays the global leader in the transition to long-term sustainability? So let's see the video with... Uh, through the global first. 
I mean about the grid. And we did exactly the opposite. We invented uh, the recovery plan, uh, first in uh, European history, and we made it an opportunity and a tool to accelerate uh, the uh, green investment. As you all know, uh, in this room, 37% uh, of the uh, recovery plan was dedicated to climate investment. Then we had a second crisis, uh, which is uh, the war in Ukraine. And then again, you had voices saying, well, now it's uh, really serious, forget about the Green Deal. And we are doing exactly the opposite. We are speeding up on renewables. We are speeding up on energy efficiency. We are this as a message to speed up the Green Deal on many, many fronts and not uh, to uh, lag behind. Uh, very concrete example. On renewables, we uh, in the Parliament are very likely uh, the decision will be made. In. We are also very likely be supportive of an increased target for energy uh, efficiency, such as the one proposed by the Commission in Repower EU. Uh, so we are moving in the right direction here. But let's be uh, frank, there is one uh, topic, one stake, where the battle is more difficult. It's farming, it's agriculture. And that's why uh, we in the European Parliament and myself as a not to move on the cap reform, cap reform on the uh, uh, farm has to be done. We put a maximum pressure for that. Uh, I hope that it will be done. I know that I had to say at that time I think now the problem is solved and we are able to move forward in the right direction. Because when you look at the figures, the, the decrease, uh, the watering down of our green legislation when it comes to biodiversity and uh, uh, agri-production. So you will that one exactly as we want the one on renewables and exactly as we want the one on renewables and we want the one on energy efficiency to speed up the Green Deal. Thank you. Yeah, we, we thank Pascal Confin for his message. So um, I'll start with Flora Kemp. Just he, he thought that we steered clear of, uh, well, we, we just thought that we had steered clear of troubled water now. Uh, the war regarding renewables and energy savings, and energy savings, um, Pascal said, but the war um, seems to be an excuse to delay the urge um, and strengthen our leadership through these subsequent crises. And thank you, Patrick, also for having uh, made already the overview look as well. Um, we can always, we are all here a little bit in a sort of like-minded group, so we can always say, is it uh, hard, the glass hard? I have a lot forgotten, because immediately, if you have, for instance, specific, as we have, these will have very long-lasting effects. And I think this was a politically very smart way for in Ukraine, but we also have global supply chains which are broken and will stay broken, but it will come out as ways so that irrespective of mandate, also has to be seen in the other elements. And I would even say, uh, because I looked at uh, Patrick's slide, the Mistine pledge was actually captured and operationalized in the Industrial Emission Directive revision. So you have to see a little bit more holistically and how the uh, Green Deal, which is indeed a very vast and mainstreamed approach, has to uh, see it in an interrelated way. Now go to energy, the second part, which is really well understood now. Um, repower power proposal, but we also have to see along with it, and I really invite you to read that, was a, um, uh, a guideline or recommendation on how to use the existing key, because there will be a little bit the crunch time and the pressures is how can we go for permitting and identify the uh, go-to areas while still making sure that you uh, respect the key, and in particular, I would say the environmental governance, which means uh, the assessments. So here uh, we work very much and closely, and it gave all of us a boost, but it also took a lot of resources. But of course, if we go more into the direction of getting towards climate neutrality and energy efficiency as well, and not only into renewables, I think that serves all the triple crisis objectives that we want to achieve. 
One area which has been much better understood now by the broader public is circularity because of the war in Ukraine. Why is that? Because the, I, the problem of supply chains that are disrupted and will stay disrupted, the cutting of dependencies from certain raw materials helps us to better explain what we always want to do is staying in within, within the planetary boundaries means stopping overconsumption but also overproduction. And now you don't have that much on which you can overproduce and overconsume. So naturally, in a way, circularity gets a boost and we can see that. Um, let me say also here we had a vast amount of what we call product-based legislation, which is for me a green industry policy. Ultimately, it will be a green trade policy. CBAM is today. ETS is today. But in the future, we look at the internal market and what products are placed on the market, coming from inside or outside, with which type of um, components, with which type of um, uh, conditions. And this brings me, and I forgot, by the way, in, in the whole issue of climate change also to mention the deforestation proposal, which was a really a true game changer, internally but also externally. But here, when you come on SOPs, the single-use plastic, batteries, batteries, now people understand, especially in the, in the energy crisis, uh, yes, we need that, we need to uh, scale up and be smart in the components and in all of this. Um, packaging, packaging waste will be one of this. You had the ESPR, the Sustainable Product uh, um, Initiative. These are product-based legislation, textile strategy. Vastly underestimated shipment of waste will come, is, is already proposed. A lot of initiatives and people will not see that they all will ultimately lead to halting the pressure on materials, keeping materials inside, having a critical mass in order to also recycle or in the first place reduce and reuse or then recycle or use other things. Um, so circularity, big boost now. Where does it leave us with zero pollution, the third big component in our strategies? I think there's at least a mental understanding by the broader public that our you know, the clean air, the clean water and all of this, health is not to be taken for granted because of the war. People also understand that more and they're becoming more attached to a healthy environment, which is meaning going towards this zero pollution um, uh, action plan goal. Food crisis, food insecurity. I would rather talk about food affordability. Yes, we have seen Transformation is super complex. It will take years. And of course, always people are scared, now prices go up, and some people have some opportunistic reflexes. But also when you see, like with Nature Restoration Law and others, we are already demonstrating, I think very clearly, that you cannot have higher yield, or at least a sustained yield, if you don't go on uh, biodiversity um, protection and uh, restoration. Food waste will be another issue. We always talk when energy, you say, about renewables and energy efficiency. When we talk about food, we should talk about food waste. The Conference on the Future of Europe was very clear on that, and by the way, in general, was very clear on it. The, those who reacted, and I don't think it was only those who are already uh, converted, uh, clear, clear, clear support for the Green Deal as the transformative agenda for Europe. Food waste will be having to be addressed in one way or another. It is uh, from Santi's side. I think we should also get it as a positive message for agriculture, and clearly it comes also from our side. So I think all in all, I'm not preaching like, oh, the Green Deal is the silver bullet for everything. I speak a lot of into industry, and they always say and say, ah, oh, now you come and tell me it's only about Green Deal. No, but if you don't do the Green Deal, I think we would be much worse off. And there's in any case no change. I mean, uh, no, no, no alternative. I mean, Lucas explained where we go. I'm not somebody who likes uh, climate anxiety. I'm somebody who wants to demonstrate that it works. 
Because if we do not demonstrate that these steps, sometimes incremental, sometimes very big ones, uh, like shipment of waste or others, if they are not taken, then we will have an issue. And therefore, we have to take people along and say it is possible. It was long, but I think it already covered everything we did for the last um, two years and what we will do in the next two years that come, so two and a half years. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Floretica. Indeed, a very rich answer. But one thing I'm taking away is a, let's say, a very optimistic outlook. You're saying that yes. um, realistic and optimistic, hopefully, that uh, the awareness has changed in terms of our dependencies and how we have to move beyond them. That is um, probably a, a positive thing. So um, let's shift the perspective um, more to a global perspective, but um, zooming out of the, of the EU context. So. Veronica, as we've heard um, already now, that the war in Ukraine has, has far-reaching consequences, not just for our region, but um, globally. Um, high prices for energy and food um, pose immediate threats on the most vulnerable communities, um, those communities that have already suffered disproportionately from the impact of the COVID-19 pan pandemic. Um, they're now hit by soaring food and energy prices. Exactly two weeks ago today, we were in Stockholm, and uh, the international community gathered there at a high-level um, environmental meeting, Stockholm Plus 50, and renewed its pledge to safeguard our planet and to secure well-being for all. So what are the prospects to accelerate um, environmental ambitions, environmental policy-making under those current geopolitical conditions at, at the global level? And thank you, Patricia. I hope you can hear me well. Yeah. Um, very nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation and uh, well done, Jeremy. Uh, and uh, good luck, uh, Patrick and Patricia. Uh, congratulations. Um, and uh, really happy to be here for this uh, uh, super important topic uh, at the moment. And, uh, and indeed, um, Florica, it's uh, very difficult to capture the, the spread of the Green Deal in the space of five minutes. Um, but so just looking at it from the global perspective, the, uh, I think it made us realize that we have to uh, link uh, also the discussion vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the, uh, the, the war in uh, Ukraine. Uh, the links between humanitarian development and peace uh, uh, efforts uh, of reconstruction, the green reconstruction uh, of, of Ukraine. Uh, the importance of food, uh, food security, food supply and production was already mentioned here, so I don't need to go into detail, but of course it has huge impacts uh, globally. Uh, at the same time, uh, tackling with uh, the consequences uh, immediately, uh, one cannot forget that we have to think in long term the long-term vision for, for food security uh, uh, and the transformation of, of the food system. I would uh, recall some of you uh, probably read it, uh, 8th of June, the uh, United Nations uh, Global Crisis Response a Group uh, produced a report uh, on, uh, on, on the situation, uh, stating that billions of people face the greatest uh, cost of living crisis in a generation. And the, the message from the Secretary General is very clear that the countries must act now uh, to save lives and livelihoods. But let me bring it again to the uh, triple planetary crisis. It's all uh, uh, very much linked there and we cannot solve one global crisis not looking at the uh, triple, triple planetary crisis. So uh, just uh, to reiterate uh, that um, what the report is very clear on the worst impact on food security, energy and finance, which is systemic, uh, severe uh, and uh, speeding up uh, impact. Uh, I mentioned the planetary crisis just to illustrate the, the numbers which are uh, very, very scary in 76 million over just two years. And, uh, the ripple effects of the war could push it to 323 million. So we are really looking at a huge global scale uh, problem. Uh, you uh, recall the Patricia Stockholm Plus 50, uh, the, the outcomes of the conference uh, is very clear and one of the key messages uh, looking both at the COVID recovery but also implementation uh, of, uh, of sustainable development goals and looking forward what needs to be done to spe speed up uh, the action. Uh, one message is very clear, the well-being of uh, the planet is absolutely essential for well-being of people. Uh, so that's, uh, the, that's where the action uh, needs to, 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 be, to be done. Uh, 
there is, uh, uh, of course, uh, increasing momentum uh, for, for the ambitions, and uh, we heard about the Green Deal, what uh, it has achieved so far, and what are the plans uh, uh, for the... is absolutely essential. And DG12, the... Issue. It's not just our issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Veronica, um, another key turning point in, in geopolitics um, and international environmental diplomacy is, of course, the, the, the trust exchanges announced by, by the Biden uh, administration, so the U.S. return to the Paris Agreement, um, their determination to achieve net zero by 2050, uh, decarbonizing domestic energy systems by 2035 already. Um, the U.S. has also pledged to um, look into other topics, illegal wildlife trafficking, logging, pollution, um, and water pollution, for instance, through through their trade um, relationships. So how can we make sure that we're um, using, uh, making best use of this window of opportunity with um, an, a, a, a European Union that is showing, or willing to show leadership at the global level and other um, global players um, showing leadership as well? Thank you, Patricia, for this question. And indeed, it was great news uh, at COP26, uh, the return of Biden administration to, uh, to the Paris Agreement. Um, now, the, the time will test uh, how this will go, uh, go progressively on, uh, the, the ability to pass uh, the relevant legislation in, in the Congress, but uh, that's not up to us to, uh, uh, to say. Um, nevertheless, there are um, lots of uh, ongoing initiatives uh, that, are, um, that, are, that are very, very much relevant to mention here. Of course, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, also I, I mentioned er earlier the plastic, uh, plastic agenda. Uh, the U.S. administration uh, has been uh, uh, su very supportive uh, in, in, this, uh, in this topic. But also, let me uh, uh, showcase one of the uh, EU-U.S. partnership, that's the methane, Global Methane Pledge, uh, that was uh, um, launched uh, again at COP26. So that's a very good example of uh, methane emissions uh, reduction efforts. Uh, and the joint partnership. Uh, on, uh, on the front of climate, we also uh, need to take in, into account that there are lots of subnational uh, initiatives on the level of states, uh, cities, and other local uh, authorities to reduce emissions. Uh, Patricia, you mentioned deforestation, uh, uh, wildlife trafficking. So there are uh, these, these examples, also the um, uh, lowering emissions by accelerating forest uh, finance, the LEAF coalition, and we could uh, mention many more. But uh, for the future, it will be uh, important for the US uh, and EU to con uh, continue the, uh, in, uh, the leadership in encouraging other uh, G20 countries uh, to accelerate the action. So I think this is really important for, for the future. But um, again, I'm not uh, per perhaps the, the best person to comment on this, but, uh, but my feeling is that uh, the discussions between EU and US are ongoing, and uh, there are lots of in, uh, initiatives and, uh, and political discussions. So uh, that's for, for in, the, in, the, in the context of the geo, uh, geopolitics uh, uh, will be important, uh, certainly for this year, and of course beyond. Uh, COP27 uh, is just behind the door, so, um, so, so we, we, we will see where, where these um, commitments will lead to. Thank you. Um, I have another question for uh, Jan uh, regarding your, your upcoming presidency on, on one other topic which is of great geopolitical interest. So, um, of course, with the, with the soaring energy prices and the environmental crisis, of course, the, there is a, even an increased urgency to shift to, to renewables. Um, and that comes with uh, new threats to, to people and the environment. We've talked already this morning about how to strike the balance between speeding up um, the shift to renewables while up, upkeeping our, um, our uh, objectives to protect biodiversity and, and ecosystems. So um, the EU is very eager to ex ex um, ensure our access to, to critical raw materials um, in third countries, materials that we need um, for the transition. Um, for instance, in the lithium triangle in, in, in Latin America, but also um, within the EU. Um, and this has already um, triggered uh, new environmental conflict. We've seen um, mass protests in Serbia around lithium mining. Um, in Portugal, um, a UNESCO World Heritage Site was threatened by a new mining project. So how can we ensure um, in the EU that um, we become independent uh, of fossil fuel imports? We reach 100% renewables um, rapidly, but we do not undermine our other objectives of zero pollution, biodiversity protection, and, and environmental justice. So given that all these raw materials are finite, um, what are the kind of demand side solutions that we need to focus on, and, and how are you going to put a focus on this topic in your presidency? 
Yes, I think part of it, uh, thank you, Patricia. Uh, I think part of it was answered already uh, with uh, uh, the link between the renewables and nature impacts. But uh, I would say that the ultimate uh, driver for us should be the circularity and uh, the way the, the better we are able to uh, move towards uh, circular economy and uh, zero pollution, uh, the, the, the more uh, we will be able to sustain those pressures and competing uh, competing interests. Because uh, certainly we do not want to create a, a problem to one part of the environment or human rights or uh, or the social dimension by uh, by moving full speed on decarbonization. So so the balance really really should be in circularity. Uh, of course, uh, we should not forget about uh, uh, what the EU does. It's not uh, uh, the, the whole of what needs to be done. Uh, one possible uh, implication of the uh, of the war is that maybe uh, uh, deep regulation uh, or uh, ignorance of uh, environmental standards uh, uh, in Russia as a consequence of uh, uh, of the isolation. So uh, that that would not help uh, us overall. But uh, uh, Looking, looking at the balance, making sure that we progress with other parts of the, uh, of the European Green Deal and thinking about how the triangle that was talked about, uh, uh, climate, uh, biodiversity or nature and uh, pollution comes, uh, comes together and uh, does not compromise one another. Thank you. Um, well, Petros, um, we're coming nearly to the end of our exchange and we want to see if there's questions from the floor. And I also encourage our online participants again to post their questions on, on Slido if you haven't done so yet. So, um, Petros, um, after hearing um, um, this exchange, um, can you summarize? Are you concerned about um, delays in the European Green Deal in the current circumstances? And what are the you know, two, three elements that you really think, um, you know, need strengthening in the European Green Deal. Um, where do we need, where, where do we need to put our priorities, uh, priorities um, to accelerate the transition? I think we need to, uh, to put our priorities in uh, transforming the narrative, in emphasizing the cost of the status quo and uh, flipping the burden of proof to those people who believe that we should delay the, the system, the systemic change in the transition. I think we should emphasize that uh, the, the, the fragility which we are in today, the, uh, the existence of multiple crises, public health crises, geopolitical crises, security crises, energy security crises, food crises, uh, a political crisis, a financial crisis, an inflation crisis, a rule of law crisis in the European Union, are all these uh, uh, endemic fragilities the result of our past policies. So we need to uh, flip the burden of proof to the people who uh, insist that we should continue doing what we have been doing for the past 30 years and expecting different results. At the same time, we really have to up our game in terms of policy deliverance, in terms of policy cohesion, because uh, what we are looking ahead is really an issue of uh, resilience in the sense of uh, a survival toolkit and we have to look very much harder in towards adaptation finance, towards public policy finance, in, in short of protecting the citizens as it is the main duty of every state to do. This is going to be a huge undertaking and uh, we cannot go back at any point now. Thank you, Petros. So I'll give Jeremy the opportunity to uh, okay, so we'll go straight to the questions. So um, I'll ask uh, our communications team if there are um, questions on Slido and they can share them with us. But I invite all of you to um, share questions with us. So just raise your hand, briefly say who you are, and maybe if there's a, you know, somebody on the panel whom you, whom you want to talk to. So let's start with John and then Peter. Uh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> John, yeah. John is here in the front. Davide, here. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Huh? Yes. Uh, good afternoon. My name is John Hontelay. I was Secretary General of the EB before Jeremy came. Uh, I must say I I'm really proud about uh, being here today, and particularly the presentation of Patrick shows how unique the EB is in uh, the way it works. It can really grasp into Miss Fink Hoyer and uh, Jeremy and, and you, Jan in particular. 
Um, we are now seeing uh, all in Europe uh, st sharp increasing uh, prices for energy in particular, and they are uh, mainly due to uh, high taxes on those uh, energy uh, products. And uh, all every country is now uh, trying to so uh, solve its, uh, its own way, mainly by reducing those taxes. And uh, the EEB has in the past also been campaigning for environmental tax reform, in including with Green Budget Europe. And isn't this really an opportunity to prevent this kind of uh, ad hoc panicking, to reduce those prices and doing ad hoc solutions and instead uh, take this as an opportunity for a new impulse for environmental tax reform. So not focusing on reducing the prices of energy, but using the increased income for the state for reducing taxes on labor for uh, in increasing uh, uh, lowest uh, incomes and so on. Because in the end, we are still, and I saw it, I think, in Luke, Luke's uh, presentation, uh, wrong taxes, uh, environmental harms for subsidies are still on the agenda. In the past, we had the UK always vetoing any attempt to discuss this in uh, the EU. Of course, there are many reasons to say that we are sad that the EU has left, but maybe this is an opportunity to bring this uh, 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 forward. Of course, you cannot do it overnight, but the first thing should, do, should be, I think, to avoid this kind of uh, every country doing its own thing and trying to lift, change this into an uh, environmental tax reform opportunity. Thank you, John. Um, I'll take one or two more questions. Um, so let's start with Peter. Let's continue with Peter, and then, yeah, I've seen. Yeah, hi. Uh, nice to be here as well, again. And of course, John goes first. Um, just w w one quick comment, I think, on the finance side, where, where you said, you know, it's not just about the money, it's about what kind of model do we give to the world. I think, true, but the finance really matters. And the finance situation right now is, is really bad. I think from a global perspective, Europe and a lot of the rich parts of the world are at risk of going into COP and going into G7 empty-handed. Um, while they're paying all these subsidies to their own uh, fuel consumption subsidies. So I, th I think there's a real problem there that we do need to worry about. My question was to Jan uh, Dusik. I think the, w the one area where I think the EU is actually showing proper global leadership is on the transition, the energy transition. And the Commission's put these new targets under Repower EU on the table. So 45% renewables, 13% efficiency instead of the previous proposals. Um, what will be a priority for the Czech presidency to, to get a, a uniting around those targets among the member states, which is always a really hard job to do for a presidency to be, you know, uniting about more ambition. But do you think this is something you could be doing? Thank you. Thank you. So let's take one more here in the front, Davide. And then uh, I'll take you in the next round. Yeah. Thank you. Thomas Arnold, DG Research and Innovation. It's really great to be here in uh, situ. Uh, very straightforward question in one sentence what sh to, to everybody. What should be the role of sufficiency in the policy mix, in particular in the light of the Chapter 5 in the new uh, Working Group 3 report of the IPCC and other related? Okay, so let's take uh, one more in the back. There was, uh, David, there was one more gentleman here. And Luc, and then I think we got enough material. My name is uh, Mr. Remmers from the True Animal Protein Prize Coalition a new partner of EB. Um, and my question is also on fiscal tax reform. Uh, so 50 years ago, EU countries uh, signed for the polluter space principle, but on agriculture and food, nothing has happened since then. Uh, so my question is, uh, should this not be a priority for EB, but also for EU institutes, also for the next presidency? Um, and knowing that uh, meat and dairy uh, cre uh, form 80% of European greenhouse gas food-related emissions. So it's, it can be um, clever to, to make a priority uh, to, to start having policies to reduce uh, consumption on those two products. And this was also asked by the last uh, IPPC report to reduce consumption uh, patterns. Thank you. Okay, so um, we have two more uh, candidates here. So I think we can still accommodate a bit more. Um, Look and Magda, and then we'll um, let you answer. Thank you, and I'll, I'll make it a really short question, but it's one, uh, something that I missed in the debate is the resource issue. Eh? Uh, it's a bit linked to sufficiency, but we're talking in a geopolitical 
uh, context here in this session as well. And the resource crunch or the need for resources is the, is the fourth level. Eh? We have climate, biodiversity and pollution, but that resource is on the bottom of it all. So what would you be your opinion on where the EU should go when it comes into the resource debates and the need for resource and actually the somehow equal distribution of access to resources? Because that's um, one of these many elephants in the room, I think. It's about access to fair access on the global level to resource. Thank you. Okay, last question, Doctor. Thank you, Magda Stoczkiewicz from Greenpeace. Um, there was a lot of talk about geopolitics, uh, and I think what we can do best for geopolitics is to really find the uh, right solutions and not false solutions. So I want to ask about FERC, the deforestation law. Uh, how can we make sure that it's not going to be watered down and it's between the Commission and the Parliament and uh, the Presidency and the, the Council, of course? We know that, and the Leaf Coalition was mentioned as well, um, I call it a fig leaf coalition because if we think that we can pay Bolsonaro to protect Amazon, then I think we are at best naive. We've been mourning yesterday a news about the two of our colleagues who were killed in uh, uh, Amazon, a UK journalist and um, a lawyer who was uh, there for, for the indigenous communities. And I think if we don't put pressure on Bolsonaro by also using our, you know, our market, not by paying him for protecting Amazon, but using our market tools, then uh, we will not get, uh, we will not stop deforestation. So the question to all of you, how can we make sure that the, the whole construction of the FERG law is not going to be compromised? We are talking now about the attack on the really uh, core of, of the law. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. Thank you also for raising the issue of environmental defenders and uh, daily attacks. So I suggest that we uh, let Florica answer first uh, on environmental tax reform, the specific mention of meat and dairy consumption. So that was one complex here, and also on the question of, of deforestation. And then I'll give the, the floor to Jan next, and I'll come to the other panelists. Yeah, and perhaps um, all is partly even interlinked. And thank you for all these questions. And I'm very grateful you raised one topic that has not been mentioned, which is also greening of finance and also uh, phasing off half of subsidies and so on. It is not a way, it is still on our agenda, uh, certainly from the agenda of uh, GG Environment. Uh, we put it also in the HEAP, which binds all institutions, where there is at least a indication of phasing out harmful subsidies, so it's clear. Uh, and we are trying with the parliament now a pilot on it, but we all know that it is more than the elephant in the room. This is about agricultural subsidies in particular. So not an easy thing. On the taxation as such, we do know, especially at this moment now, when prices go up and energy and others, VAT is national. Uh, so it's not, even, it's not even about a tax reform and making it uh, under unanimity. But as we have seen with COVID, with, uh, also with energy, Going together is easier than, um, uh, you know, having competition even among member states, at least at the border region. So clearly something where you put it spot on and uh, your colleague as well, and we will look into it, but I cannot uh, speak now for my, my, my colleagues from um, DG Taxu, but I actually had a discussion with, with Gerasimus on that. Uh, two words on resource mobilization. Um, one of the biggest issues under all of our um, COPs, especially the biodiversity COP and also the Sham el Sheikh, which is always about it. At the same time, I'm rather relaxed because as EU, because of the financial architecture, we do have enough money still earmarked in order to uh, stay on course with ODA, with the rest, uh, and even pledged already in Glasgow the doubling of the doubling. The, other issue is, however, uh, and it is also because in the NDC, for instance, we are enabled and we work very, very well with INPA on, and that brings me also to deforestation, if we want to go for certain approaches, sustainable approaches, we have also have to nurture and take the others along and say we are 
helping you to change not only inside but also outside the transaction, the, um, the production processes, and to support you and uh, also in, in all the on the all the rest. Um, deforestation. I would be glad to be quite honest, and I will be super honest here now. It is not about having a little bit higher scope here or uh, one definition there. We need to make sure that the core elements of that proposal, which was about benchmarking, about due diligence, about going off saying we hold uh, on our request so the certain commodities coming on the market to respond to certain requirements. This is, this is the core architecture. And if you now say, ah, but I'm more important, and I know it, to go on the savannas or to go on mice instead of that, don't fool yourself. There are many, many who will give you that, but they will encroach and hollow out the core elements, and then in the end we have nothing. So for me, it's a stepped-up approach. I'm rather concerned that this proposal, like the shipment of waste, which we put forward last year, is still nowhere. We might get a we might get a uh, approach, a general approach in the council, and then we can hopefully after summer also with the parliament start on a trilogue. But I hope that people understand that uh, we need to preserve the core elements. This is very important. And then Mercosur and Bolsonaro, you, I'm, I'm with you. But deforestation is a game changer if we manage it well. And we have put in revision clauses in order to then up it up. But now everybody comes, we have so many, so many amendments in the parliament, and it is welcomed by many people. Because the more you don't see then the real core elements anymore. So I'm concerned on that, absolutely. Um, and then I hand over to others. Thank you. I will first give the floor to the other panelists for the, for the sake of time. Maybe you can take it up just after the discussion and continue discussions. So I wanted to uh, also give the floor to Jan because there was a specific question to, to Jan, um, especially about the, the energy transition and, and kind of your, um, uh, well, the question and how far you're going to unite uh, the members in the council um, on, on the new targets there. So uh, Jan, I'll briefly let you answer that question. Uh. Thank you very briefly. Yes, uh, I see the uh, Fit for 55 and 3 Power EU uh, as uh, two sides of the same coin, and uh, uh, not only uniting the voices in the Council, but also uh, trying to bring together the voices from the Council and from the Parliament will be uh, will be on our agenda. Uh, and obviously, what we are uh, what we are trying to do to address uh, the short-term energy crisis and uh, how the next winter will look like uh, uh, should be done in the optics of uh, not diverting from our long-term objectives and, uh, and the one and a half degree and all the all the elements of the fit for 55. So that also goes for how we can use the revenues uh, coming from the uh, from the energy taxes from the emission allowances, uh, uh, how they can feed into the system that uh, uh, will lead to accelerating our uh, decarbonization. There is limits of what is possible within, uh, uh, as, as was mentioned, within the uh, EU uh, competencies. Uh, but there is also the discussion that uh, we will also deal with during the, the EU uh, presidency uh, concerning the. Uh, conference on the future of Europe and uh, the implications for how we should be keeping, how we should be deciding uh, on, um, on European legislation in the future, and perhaps that question of taxation that uh, otherwise predominantly uh, national can be addressed uh, uh, as well. And uh, my my final point would be uh, uh, on the. Um, on the taxonomy that uh, uh, is moving ahead and that gives us, uh, I think, a good indicator how we should look at things uh, interconnected and uh, uh, hopefully uh, hopefully that will uh, also help us uh, on the way to uh, circularity and the, the Green Deal objectives. Thank you and thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Jan. So there were two more questions on the question of kind of well, efficiency and sufficiency. So it's come out missing debate on kind of how much do we actually need to use, to, to live well um, and to stay within that. And the question that, that Luke raised about 
the resource question. I mean, we, we've put the question to Jan on the kind of the, the, the you know, increasing scramble for raw materials for the transition and, and, well, the EU's eagerness to kind of secure access that comes with a lot of environmental and social impact. So um, I'll ask uh, Veronica and, and Jeremy to briefly comment on these questions if they want to, um, or any of the other ones before we close the panel. Well, they are very good questions. Sorry. Sorry, there are very good questions and uh, very difficult to, uh, to respond to in a, a very short answer. But uh, uh, on the how much do we need and also a little bit on the resource uh, uh, question, um, I think it's important to also realize that it was one of the uh, outcomes of the Stockholm Plus 50 conference is that we have to go beyond GDP, uh, that not only measure the well-being through uh, the lens of, of, of GDP. So I think that's, uh, that's important that we carry this on uh, on, on different levels. On the question of, uh, of, of resources, look, um, um, I don't want to comment on the EU legislation and policies, but, but it, is, it is a very valid question which we should ask ourselves, uh, because uh, the, uh, the resources, if I'm not uh, mistaken, the, uh, the, the, the use of resources tripled in the last 50 years, so it is a huge uh, issue, and also uh, it's linked to the growth in population. There it keeps being higher and higher demand for resources. Uh, there are lots of uh, lots of uh, uh, initiatives that are going on on, on the global level. I would name, the, uh, for example, the recent Global Alliance on Resource Efficient uh, on Circular Economy and Resource Efficiencies, which is again very much linked to uh, to circular economy uh, and SDG 12. We do have to reconsider how much do we uh, use, um, uh, produce, and and use. Uh, so that comes back also to the individual action and uh, behavioral shift. Uh, which uh, so it's not only on the governments, but uh, but on, on all stakeholders and us uh, uh, us individually as well. But this is this is more philosophical question. But but uh, definitely the resources. It's uh, it's, it's something that uh, we will struggle even more in the years to come. Jeremy. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. Maybe starting with the resources issue. If if I remember correctly, we were pushing already um, back in the the first. Um, uh, circular economy package that was under the Barroso Commission already then for headline targets on resource reduction. I mean, if you think about all the different targets we've got, but we don't actually have one. Um, so we were looking at a headline target and, and different uh, aggregated, disaggregated targets. Uh, we didn't succeed, and then we had the next, that was withdrawn, as you famously remember, and then there was the new one. And, and then we had the second, uh, more recent circular economy package. And, and this is unfortunately, I, and that, I think that second circular economy package was quite widely seen as rather good, actually, one of the, the good things to come out of this commission. But uh, on that issue, um, we, we did not succeed. So I think that is something that we do need to address. Um, I mean, on the issue of sufficiency, efficiency, yeah, of course, we, we absolutely need to move uh, in that direction. Um, and I, I mean, I think we can't really go very far in this discussion, but I just want to give a plug to two of the breakout sessions where I think this, this issue will be on the agenda, um, one on circularity and one on economic transition. I'm not sure which one's the best one. I don't even know if they're conflicting because I don't have the program memorized, uh, but I would recommend that that discussion is uh, taken up there. I, I feel that we made a lot of progress at the rhetorical level um, we see in each of the three uh, main EU institutions, we see serious discussions going on on this. Um, I think where we're kind of falling short is translating the sort of consent, growing consensus that we need to think more in those terms into kind of concrete policy measures. So there's, there's quite a lot of work to do there. But, you know, winning the battle at the, at the high level, uh, narrative level, is, is important as well as a, as a step towards more concrete measures. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for all your answers. So we're coming to the end of our time. I hope, Petros, you will forgive me that uh, we're not coming back to you, but I think we'll be working together closely with you and the other MEPs in the SDG Alliance towards the um, European Union's uh, VNR next year. And I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll give a lot of attention to all the questions of negative externalities, whether it's deforestation, uh, resource consumption, etc. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. And I hope that uh, you will use the lunch break to continue discussions. I'm sure there's many more questions 
questions. It's also not the end of the day. We have uh, still more um, interesting sessions and breakout sessions coming up. So I would like to thank everybody um, on the panel, our guests uh, joining us remotely from Prague and Athens for being with us this morning. Um, we have a lunch break now until uh, 1.20. We will continue then with the breakouts. And for those of you joining us online, we'll continue um, with a plenary session from 3.30 to 5.30. So please join us again at 3.30, those of you joining online. Um, and uh, I'll give the floor to Florica, yes. who wanted to yes. say yes. a few yes. final yes. words, thank you. I thank understand. You. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm sorry, you have to be a... I'm standing between you and the lunch, but just one, one, one minute. Because this is, for me, the last uh, official event with Jeremy in his official function as Secretary General still. And um, therefore, as representative of DG Environment, but also personally, I wanted to use this occasion to publicly really um, applaud him, commend him, but also thank him for being such a great friend. And a great friend means somebody that challenges you, that brings the best out of you, but that also stands with you along the way, in the good and in the bad times. And Jeremy, for 11 years, has always been that, uh, to my uh, DG, to my colleagues, but also in the last years to me. And in that honor, and in a very, very small gesture, we wanted to at least offer you one uh, tree for every year that you have worked and supported us as a friend, and then to make it round 12. So thank you so much, and please, please join me in this big thank you with an applause. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch break.
And if you're confused, we're going to soon stop you from being confused. I'm going to introduce Nick, and he's going to then explain why. And then after we have the little video, we'll then have the reporting back. But I hand over to Nick now, who may have given you a donut. And if you didn't get one today, there's still some more there. Well, it's not much to say, just uh, to press play on the video. This video speaks for itself. Because we didn't just give a donut, you'll see why. It's a casual Wednesday, and we're handing out some donuts to people at the European Commission. Why, you might ask? Because we're trying to convince DG Grow to change their name to DG Donut. But more on that later. You see, the European Commission is made up of many departments, or directorate generals. In short, DGs. DG Grow is Commission's very own dedicated function to ensure non-stop economic growth within the Union, even at the expense of people and planet. I'm sorry, are you looking for DG Donut? But wait, why do we want to change the name to DG Donut? Thank you. The donut economy is a concept developed by economist Kate Raworth to represent an economic model that is more considerate and delicious with respect to social and planetary boundaries. We frankly prefer this because of all the lovely ingredients it contains. Let's add some social foundation. And also important, the ecological aspect. And all you have to do is mix, mix, mix to get a beautiful donut economy. But wait a minute, are we sure this is a good idea? What would life even look like inside such a donut economy? For sure, live from the donut, I can report that a world with a donut economy and a DG donut would be amazing. Our current economic growth model has driven us to over-extract resources, exploit labor, and over-consume, with people and nature across the world suffering the consequences, all for the profit of a few. The donut economy is different. It aims to ensure the well-being of all within the planetary boundaries. If that's not a great idea, I do not know what is. So what's the plan? I think we have a lot of new tools, like the donuts. Because it's easy, it's going to convince a lot of people to think differently about the economy. I want the EU to be the global champion of the green transformation that is making our economy fit. We can make a big difference at the level of the European Union, and we're really determined to try. Our message is clear. Come, take a bite of this tasty future. It's a casual. Great, thank, thank you, Nick. Thank you, the colleagues. Um, and there's still some more donuts here. But now we're heading to the, to the session. We had eight breakout sessions. Okay, it was only 40 minutes each, and we had a little bit of chaos getting there. Um, so we, it's only really the start of the conversation rather than a definitive conclusion of everything. Um, and now, without much further ado, we're going to present one by one the rapporteurs from each session to give you three or four minutes of some key points. You don't have to cover everything, just three or four minutes, so you can skip over a few if you've got too many. Um, and thanks in advance also to the speakers and also to the rapporteurs for making it work and for all of you for surviving this temperature. So the first one is, we'll start with, I'll give the order first so that everyone knows in which order they come. But we start with climate, and that'll be Brigitte Bozel from Can Europe. Then we'll go to governance, and we've got Anaïs Berthier. Then we move to supporting the green ambition in the wider world beyond the EU, Sasha Gabison from uh, WECF. And then we've got lots of talking people over there. And then after that, we'll have pollution making zero pollution reality, and that's Vladka. Matkovic from Heal. So we'll start with those four. And then after those four, we move towards a circular, circular economy. It's Justin Wilkes of ECOS. Then Nature and the Sixth Extinction, Martin Harper from BirdLife. Then we move, I don't know if you've remembered all this, but hopefully the people will. Um, then Economic and Fiscal Reform, Esther Asin from WWF, EPO. And finally, Chemicals, Non-Toxic Environment, Stefan Scheuer, um, who's got many, many hats. Um, Brian, so I'll just hand over now for the first, please. Um, the floor is yours, Brigitte. Okay. I, I shall sit down, sorry for this, but I have my notes in my laptop and it's easier. So, with the help of um, Davide, we got a little overview of what's uh, the good and uh, 
bad and ugly in the, in the European Green Deal so far. Uh, so we got this rapid assessment. There are some good policies in place, a lot of uncertainties and a lot of lack of ambition. And me coming from Can Europe, can, uh, I can really confirm that we are very far off track on the road to, to Paris. Um, we discussed some ideas how to create those transformative policies that we really need, uh, especially in the transport and industry sectors. Um, Transport is still the problem child of the economy, if you didn't know that. Uh, COVID seemed to provide a chance to, to change this, and especially in biking and the creation of biking lanes, we saw that um, it really transformed the, st uh, the streets. But the scale of the change is not, not there in the transport sector. Uh, the transport sector is also not uh, on track to the road to 1.5. Uh, we are not significantly changing the way we move around in our um, cities and, and on the countryside. But we are facing a moment when we are bending the curve on, on road transport. So we can expect that in the next uh, 10 years there will be a dramatic change on how we, how we drive and where we drive and what we drive. Uh, so in that terms, uh, the phase out of the in internal combustion engine was a symbolic win now um, in, the, in the parliament and we uh, expect to, to build on that and, and continue. But it's very important that we are showing now a power and standing up against industry lobby and uh, uh, showing the, the power of, 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 uh, of the market and the, the green uh, planning ahead. Um, so moving on to some other breaking of in industry power, we also considered the um, uh, impacts of the war and, uh, and its impact on the gas industry. So you know that gas has been uh, uh, um, a long time seen as a transition fuel, as a, a silver bullet uh, to, so, uh, to phase out uh, coal in, uh, especially. But now uh, with the Russian invasion, it became uh, even more questionable. And uh, uh, with the heat pumps um, um, being available and uh, um, being spread more and more, we can see that uh, there's a solution, real solution on the horizon. But we need to scale this up and uh, we need to make it available for people. And uh, this was my, my last point that um, um, after talking about this industrial transformation and all those transformative policies, we do need to bring society and people on the board and we as civil society need to uh, stand up and, and, and grow into our role to demand even better policies, even more urgent action. And we have to use our courts, national courts as well, uh, uh, as it, it can become a very important tool to, to make governments accountable. Thank you very much, Brigitte. And just to say that climate change has impacts, I read the second page first rather than the first page first. So now to correct the order, we'll go, but thank you very much, that was brilliant and very timely. So now to circularity, we have Justin. Is Justin there? And also for those others who are gonna report back, we've got some of the presentations, but we haven't got all of them. So please go to the technical experts over there so that we can upload the presentation. I think Justin, I've, yours. I've, I've emailed my slides. I think they're there, yeah. So hopefully you can press the button. But this or this? As you like, I don't know if it's on. Check. Does this work? Yeah. Yes. Is this, is this a bomb? Or? You've got to press the, 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 the green arrows outwards. There we go. So this uh, group uh, was, uh, the presenter in the group was Stefan, uh, the moderator, Carsten, and we had uh, panelists, uh, May, Benton, and Asia. Uh, and you were there so early, I thought you were seeing uh, in terms of the uh, European Green Deal midterm assessment that we, 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 we sort of glossed over a little bit. Uh, in terms Sorry? Closer to the mic. There we go. Does that work better? Jolly good. Uh, so in terms of the uh, Sustainable Products Initiative uh, and the expansion of the eco-design framework, uh, we now have a proposal from the Commission uh, that is expanding out uh, the framework from energy-related products uh, to 
uh, most uh, product groups, particularly high impact groups, uh, textiles, furniture, uh, primarily uh, and initially. Uh, we have the strategy uh, for circular and sustainable textiles out. Uh, I'm getting louder. We have the circular economy uh, electronic strategy um, and the construction product regulation uh, published, uh, which is a bit of good news, a bit of bad news, uh, but it's still, uh, we've included it in the green traffic lights. Uh, in terms of the EPBD, uh, the uh, Energy Performance of Buildings Directive uh, revision, still too focused uh, on energy in use stage uh, and neglects the potential emissions uh, savings uh, linked to sufficiency uh, and circularity. Uh, the waste shipment regulation uh, as well we have uh, as an amber traffic light. In terms of red, uh, the raw material strategy, uh, too high a focus uh, on short-term economic gains uh, and demand-side solutions uh, ignored uh, and EU and national level targets to ensure commitment and buy-in are missing for key files. In terms of transforming the European Green Deal, uh, the discussion uh, focused on shifting the focus from predominantly uh, carbon intensity to more equal footing uh, with resource use. Uh, one example being why a CBAM only uh, and why not a, a material BAM. Uh, focus also on cutting Europe's resource footprint and the real key discussion that we had as a group was uh, the idea of setting a resource use uh, material uh, footprint reduction target. Uh, and there was also a, a, a discussion on shifting the focus uh, obviously within the circularity discussion from closing the loop uh, to the design phase. So why the focus on cutting Europe's resource uh, footprint uh, and coming up with a target? We have uh, targets, we have uh, a lot of targets when it comes to climate, when it comes to energy, when it comes to energy savings, when it comes to renewables. Binding, not binding, you can uh, have a discussion on whether targets are better being binding or not, whether that's relevant. Uh, what's important is the framework that those targets uh, give. The targets give you your ambition, they give you the clarity in terms of your direction of travel, and they require your binding framework in order that they are achieved but we don't have the same for reuse uh, and circular economy. I have no idea why there are three monkeys there. Um, anyone who wants to know can ask Stefan, who uh, introduced the monkeys. So in terms of footprint resource use reduction target, uh, being an absolutely key part of the discussion, uh, why do we want the targets? Uh, because that then requires a supportive policy framework uh, with a focus on dematerialization. Targets, though, do need to be carefully defined uh, and set, uh, and trade-offs uh, between the different footprints uh, need to be considered, and circularity, is that the end or is that a mean to, the, to an end? In terms of accurate measurement metrics needed for monitoring, uh, clear definitions and targets for circularity, such as durability, reusability, repairability, uh, the uh, eco-design for sustainable product regulation, will be an absolutely key tool for delivery uh, in terms of uh, resource use. Uh, and also key to acknowledge that any methodology uh, has its imperfections, uh, can be used, can be misused uh, as per your objective. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Justin, and also to Carsten, Stefan, Maud, Bente, and Asya. For that and now handing over onto the nature side uh, for Martin Harper. Thanks. And see three to four minutes. Yeah. I've got the slides. Yeah. Okay. So I've got two slides. Uh, the first one is how we're we getting on, a bit of a summary, and the second one is what are we going to do next. Uh, to say a massive thank you to Faustine for chairing, and then also for Sergei and Tobias from EEB and Sees at Risk, respectively, for giving a bit of input at the beginning. This is just a summary of some of the issues we flagged up based partly on the EB assessment, but also on the Blue Manifesto assessment, which obviously from Marine point of view focuses on how we're getting on for Marine. Um, many of you will know the progress we've made on the biodiversity strategy that's in the green box, along with the zero pollution um, action plan, which came out with a fantastic statement in April saying how we're gonna phase out uh, some of the worst chemicals. Um, in, this, in this sort of amber category, we talked about food and farm, um, farm to fork earlier, but
But those of you who may not be aware that the global ocean conservation agenda is slightly being undermined by no real progress on the moratorium on deep sea mining. Um, policy incoherence, that's been around as long as I've been on this planet. Uh, and uh, we're not really making the progress we want on agriculture and fisheries, which continue to undermine ambitions elsewhere. Uh, and the full solutions for speeding up decarbonisation has been a theme running through the whole of today. Um, in terms of how, what are we going to do next? Well, this slide really, I think, sums it up for me. Um, the first thing to say, obviously, the context is terrible. The statistics are terrible. The challenges we're facing are hard. But we should be optimistic. Um, because not only is the 2030 vision good, particularly on biodiversity, um, but also that many of us, um, we've demonstrated how to make things better and we know how to do it. Uh, and the way I've categorised the, the sort of the conversation we had, slightly using my own words, is that you've got to turn a vision into a plan which, which has action. And to my mind, there's three elements to that. Campaign hard to get the nature restoration law as good as possible. Um, focus on implementation, and that is at a national level, to try and deliver on the big ambitions for protection, management and restoration. Uh, Mobilise the money, now that's hopefully going to be delivered before I'm dead, uh, by redirecting the perverse subsidies to tackle unsustainable um, fisheries and agriculture. And then so there's some two cross-cutting issues. One is about how we as civil society make sure we continue to use our voices for nature to counter the false narratives, to campaign hard, um, but also to make sure we're prepared to talk about some of these really difficult conversations around things like consumption changing to diet. And my th final thing I was allowed to give my own personal view is one which I've been banging on for a while about, which is investing in our sector, uh, making sure we've got the skills, capacity, capability to deliver this new ambition. And to my mind, that means we need an industrial strategy for our land, freshwater, marine management sector for the 2030 that we want to deliver. And if we do all of that, then hopefully our continent will lead the world in restoration. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Martin. We're now going to head over to the economy and fiscal reform uh, for systemic change. And it's going to be Esther Asin from director of WWF EPO. Thanks, Esther. I think you just keep pressing here. Just the green one, yeah. No. Um, your dots are oh, yes. Okay. Can you hear me well? Good afternoon. My voice is fading. But, um, on the positives, um, and always uh, this reporting never does enough justice to uh, you know, the discussion we had. But clearly the narrative around just transition and the concept is a good step forward because it has allowed more engagement uh, with trade unions, but also it has somehow forced actors beyond the environment community to talk and, and work together, and, uh, but more funding is needed to, to make it work. On, on the amber, um, not that we don't like the well-being framework, we really like it very much and support it very much, but it's more about this, um, how, how we monitor, how we count it. And we have thresholds for social and environment, but then when we get them, it's too late. So we were considering, could we think about alarm bell mechanisms, both environmental and social, that then could trigger you know, policy, policy reactions? And we also talk about the SDGs because the SDGs they are still there. They are this holistic framework. And there was a feeling that there was somehow a missed opportunity in the European Green Deal. Uh, they do provide the basis maybe for indicators. And we talk, and, and maybe colleagues would complement, about this policy coherence for sustainable uh, development. And Martin was flagging the policy incoherences. Then on the red, uh, clearly mining and resource extraction because as we are observing in the context of the war in Ukraine, um, the crisis and the war is also used to lower environmental standards. There's a, there's a real risk there. And we are also observing, um, we, we flagged especially the context of the national resilience and recovery plans, uh, less democracy, less involvement, and less transparency in decision making, especially around economic governance. So, Recommendations. Well, we have a very short-term call to action to everyone because we discussed the taxonomy. The taxonomy was an interesting one. It was, re um, sorry, uh, no, green. 
because it has the potential to move the trillions that they are needed for the transition. But currently, we are seeing a lot of red with the, um, with the current delegated act on gas and nuclear. So there's a short-term call to action to all of you. Please write to your MEPs asking to turn down and to vote against the delegated act for the plenary EP plenary in July. That's the first one. On raw materials, we agree that we needed to address two critical issues. The first is the fair share of the distribution of the resources, and the second is who decides and the right to say no from communities. And um, related to participation, um, uh, the colleagues mentioned what we call also citizens washing, you know, so uh, doing a bit of a window dressing exercise when it comes to participation. So we have to avoid that and also strengthen civil society participation in economic governance. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much, Esther, and also to, to Katy and Anilia uh, Stefanova. So next on is uh, chemicals towards a toxic economy. So that's Stefan Scheuer. I don't know if Stefan's already ready. Someone who will in Stefan, yes. So while you're walking up, and Stefan also say thank you to Mikhail Carson, uh, ex uh, former EB president, also Tatiana Santos and uh, Elena, Elena, our Elena from Mercury. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Patrick. So you said I have many hats, but I'm here for Camp Trust. Um, <laughs> just to make that clear. So yeah, we had a, a good discussion. Um, Quite a lot of uh, people from the EB, that was good to see, but we tried to make sure so we get all the input from the non-EB people. Um, now, could we move to the next slide, please? I'm relying on some service over there. Um, no, please, next one. Shall I do? Right, and one back. Here we go. So let me start with the big picture. Um, what we get from the European Green Deal. And that is, it's in a way amazing for uh, chemicals uh, campaigners like me. I started 20 years ago to see that we get finally the right ob objectives up there. So toxic free environment. The ambition is there and uh, over 80 actions set out in the chemical strategy for sustainability. It feels like no stone left unturned. So really we have a good starting point here. Um, and this is true uh, for chemicals, uh, but of course also for special parts of it, like mercury, where the EB has quite a lot of strength in. Uh, but it also goes further into the pollution part, which I'm not covering that much here. Now, the risks we are facing uh, are straightforward. We are sort of riding on a wave, the European Green Deal. Uh, you know, it's not uh, coming from chemicals, it's coming clearly from a climate movement. And uh, it has brought us an incredible push for a transformation which we also need in the chemical sector. But it wasn't like we were ready for knowing exactly how this chemicals industry is going to transform. Um, so we are now facing a risk uh, that we are sort of becoming a slower part of implementing this uh, Green Deal, that we are left a bit behind, that there is pressure now from the industry side, of course, uh, calling for breathing space because of the crisis, whatever crisis, it's a very opportunistic call, of course. Um, and it's very, uh, you know, difficult to just make up the right narratives, to be back in the game and make sure uh, we are not dropping off uh, the European Green Deal uh, <coughs> rollout and implementation. So the delays is the big risk we are facing. And it's also falling back on the Commission in uh, not having a clear roadmap, uh, in knowing how these more than 80 actions, how they're going to play out, um, how they all link together, how is that integrating with the bigger picture of the transformation uh, of Europe's economy. Um, then we are faced with um, very smart industry, of course. Uh, chemical industry knows what it is doing. Uh, it has, uh, over the last uh, decades, always managed to keep its chemicals as long as possible on the market uh, in order to make their profits. Um, it uh, might take uh, decades to identify and ban a most hazardous chemicals, um, and it takes only weeks uh, to get it on the market, actually. Um, 
So now the next one is now to, uh, chemical recycling. Um, so the chemical industry is working hard on that narrative, trying to find a new feedstock. Um, obviously, with moving out of fossil fuels, uh, the chemical industry is facing a substantial challenge uh, in its uh, feedstock and, um, you know, collecting all the plastics around and promising a chemical recycling which could clean up the toxics in there is uh, very, uh, you know, uh, seducive and uh, uh, takes some traction. So we have to watch out for these false industry solutions coming up. Um, the further problems we have is uh, in the strategy, as I mentioned already, the lack of uh, transformative power really being deployed, uh, coming along with stronger transparency and accountability actions uh, on the decision making, but also on the products and chemicals itself. And finally, the big absence we have in the European Green Deal on chemicals is actually a policy target. So I've listened carefully to what was said before on the circular economy. It is about targets. It's about targets which drive the policy implementation, uh, which hold uh, politicians accountable, which work like KPIs. Um, and uh, uh, it is possible to do that for chemicals. We think it, we can have targets uh, for a 2030 time horizon um, and that link to implementation roadmap uh, to deliver. So recommendations in short, uh, we need policy targets. Um, as ChemTrust we are calling for uh, a 2030 target by which all the most harmful chemicals are banned from consumer products, from all consumer products. There will be exemptions for essential uses, uh, but that must be limited. Um, we need to be very alarmed about the delays and make sure we stay in the European Green Deal implementation timeframe. Uh, delays now might mean this Commission might not do in time its things anymore for this Parliament, so it has big impacts and I would say this is maybe the biggest campaigning place for us as a community where we have to come in uh, and uh, uh, expose the risks of those delays. Uh, we need to further look at the need for systemic change, um, false solution I mentioned, and uh, reinforce transparency and accountability. We had also um, uh, members who were calling for and making us aware of the double standard issue that the EU might ban things inside the EU but still exports them. Uh, that is true for pesticides, that's true for mercury, uh, and of course for the whole waste sector. Um, that's something very campaignable and has to be exposed. And finally, we're coming to a big area of chemicals policy, which is impact assessments. You all know now impact assessments. It's a standard procedure in the EU. It actually comes from 20 years ago, REACH, uh, when it was designed. We had uh, more than 20 impact assessments, and the Commission decided there to harmonize, standardize the process of impact assessments. We're getting back to it. Uh, it will be all about costs to industry, and we're having really difficulties to get up the costs of inaction the cost to our society, to the health sector, uh, to the ecosystem services. Uh, these are the things we have to strengthen quite a lot, our capacities. So that's a, a quick run through. And I'm sure I missed one of the other points, but if I don't know if there's an opportunity for people to come in. Maybe we'll see how the time goes. But we have got the reception, so. <laughs> So thanks very much again, Stefan. We've got three left so, uh, before the next session. So next on is Governance, Delivering Sustainability and Democratic Accountability. And it's Anaïs Berthier from Client Earth. Thank you. Yeah. They should be here. Uh, there it is. Voilà. Um, so, oh, ah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Better>. <laughs> Um, well, thanks to Yergi Yaldoshka uh, for moderating the discussion and leading the discussion sometimes, and uh, Francesca as well um, for, for setting the scene uh, in that breakout session. So first, what's, what's good? And we'll start with the amendment of the Aris regulation, and this is a special dedication to Jeremy. Uh, so the result is that this Aris regulation has been finally amended after a more than 10 year legal battle before the Aris Convention Compliance Committee, but also before all the European institutions possible. And the result is that the right of access to justice for NGOs, but also for individuals, has been broadened. 
And so that's a good opportunity for me to tell you today, NGOs and individuals, you can challenge way more decisions adopted by European institutions, first through an administrative process and then eventually before the Court of Justice of the EU. And so uh, it's maybe not as ambitious as we would like it to be, but it's already a great, great, great achievement. And so thank you, Jeremy, because without you, and without your support in terms of advocacy work and etc., I don't think we would have achieved the same results. So, so thanks to you. Another good thing is the Industrial Emissions Directive proposal. Uh, we are really, really happy about that one. The European Commission has integrated uh, a provision in the proposal uh, providing the rights uh, to members of the public to claim for some compensation rights. And they go as far as well as reversing the burden of the proof. So that's really super ambitious. That's really the way we want to go. And uh, we hope that is going to remain throughout the legislative process and that is, it is going to remain in the final text. Fingers crossed, so through the European Parliament and the Council. Uh, and we'd like to see that provision replicated into other pieces of legislation. So, for example, the air quality directive would be a good one to start with. Uh, what is less good, um, good but could be improved, is that we see there is a certain willingness for now, we are just at the stage of the Commission's proposal, to improve company liability. So we see that through the sustainable corporate governance due diligence legislative proposal. Uh, really, I mean, not as ambitious as we would like it to be, uh, especially climate. Uh, so we heard this morning the Director General of DG Environment saying climate is way better understood today, but under that piece of legislation, the due diligence obligation do not apply to climate. So a big, big, big loophole to address in there. Uh, but progress on company liability, maybe, again, it needs to remain in the final text and through the European Parliament and Council decision-making process. Progress also on that ground in the Environmental Crime Directive proposal. Um, less good when the Irish regulation was being revised, uh, the Commission limited the revision to the access to justice provisions. We would have liked to also have the opportunity to improve the access to information pillar and the public participation pillar. Although we need to be careful for what we wish for because if we reopen the whole uh, piece of legislation, uh, we may not like the result necessarily. Stated decision as well still cannot be challenged under the Irish regulation. And that's uh, something we need to continue fighting for because state aid decisions have huge impact on the environment, of course. Um, what is really uh, bad? So I think we are all alarmed and concerned with the Repower Communication, uh, Repower EU, sorry, communication. It has some good aspects, but what is really, really, really concerning is that there are some provisions that simply undermine and circumvent some requirements that are aimed at protecting biodiversity, nature, and water quality, uh, especially uh, in relation to the permitting pr procedure of renewables. And so that goes with the kind of incoherence as well we see in that Green Deal. Uh, there are some really good stuff, but then uh, there are some huge inconsistencies as well. So the Commission kind of gives with the one hand and retake what they've been given with the other hand uh, and, and that's to be improved and that we see clearly with a great biodiversity strategy but then with the Repower EU communication a huge step backwards so that's really really alarming. There is a lack of procedures as well to assess cumulative environmental impacts of decisions taken at EU level and a lack of transparency still in the decision making process whether it is at the regulatory uh, uh, scrutiny board uh, or within the infringement proceedings and the comitology procedures. So recommendations really quickly, more coherence. We want to see the strategies being translated faithfully into the legally binding provisions. We want an increase in transparency 
within the infringement proceedings, but also the comitology process and at the level of the regulatory scrutiny boards. We want to see the principle of do no significant harm as provided in the taxonomy generally apply across the board. And in relation to enforcement and in, uh, implementation, uh, improvement of these procedures as well. Mrs. Van der Leyen committed herself to ensure better enforcement. We haven't seen any progress. And to see this progress, capacity within DG environment needs to be increased. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right, thank you very much, Anais. And now we have two left. Now, beyond EU, uh, supporting the green ambition in the wider world, we have Sasha Gabison. Thank you. Thank you. So, let's see. Uh, we had a great moderator, Tony, thank you very much, and a presentation from Patricia. And I have some slides, which are um, many, many. Uh, okay, this, oh yeah, this is the old version, where we don't have the slides of Patricia. Sorry, Patricia. How does it work? <laughs> Next one, please. <laughs> Someone, thank you. Um, so we, um, we discussed that, you know, when uh, Antoni is from um, Croatia, when uh, the Commission announced the Green Deal, the European Green Deal, that was like a huge shock in the country, like, whoa, <laughs> now what is happening here? Uh, and we know that many um, partner countries, also from the Global South, especially the petro states, were, are not at all pleased and are very afraid of conditionalities in EU funding, etc. But that is really the really good thing about and the great uh, chance and opportunity which we have in our international cooperation that we have uh, the European Green Deal as a key issue for all cooperation. We focus specifically on the neighborhood region in our discussion. Um, and we looked also at this opportunity that we have uh, just heard that uh, many of the EU um, member states are indeed supporting the plans for the EU accession of Ukraine, Moldova, and uh, if I understand also Georgia. And um, that of course is a great opportunity um, for, uh, as we know, that uh, the accession process has created in many of our new uh, member states a real a speed up of environmental legislation. Um, so that is a great thing. Now we have still some, um, some challenges that Often this has not been accompanied, uh, this accession, with sufficient support of civil society, especially not of environmental civil society, NGOs, and that here we need to do much more um, pressure that there is sufficient funding really also to build the awareness and, uh, and um, the monitoring and the uh, push for compliance by civil society. And um, yeah, therefore we want to create, uh, yeah, we need to focus on this issue because that's not yet good enough. Uh, and then the main issue is also how do we create a socially just uh, transition, uh, especially in um, candidate countries, and uh, do we have, um, yeah, do we have enough uh, understanding of what that means? Um, and we also looked at what was not very good at the moment, such as um, <laughs> what we already discussed in the morning, uh, unsustainable infrastructure investments, um, investments in fossil gas infrastructure in neighborhood countries, locking them into uh, fossil fuels and unsustainable investments with EU, EU support, uh, lack of scrutiny, transparency, corruption, uh, and also a lack of alternatives towards, for example, Chinese funded uh, investments in other fossil fuels or in mining. So all of that is, um, was also discussed this morning. Now in our discussion group, yeah, um, so we, um, we looked at, okay, what can we recommend um, at this moment? We're looking at um, really extending a just transition mechanism, a socially just transition mechanism, ensuring uh, that uh, there's transparency and that civil society is really at the heart of this green agenda as watchdogs, as implementers, uh, at the decision-making table. And then we looked also and discussed specifically about the Ukraine reconstruction. We had a colleague, Andre, here from Ukraine, who I understand had a 50 hour trip to get to be with us. And uh, we learned a lot. Uh, we learned a lot about, okay, the new communication for the accession on the Ukraine um, is there, but it needs much more uh, transparency and um, ensuring really the participation of Ukrainian civil societies from all sectors. 
Um, and that we also really need to get funding of reconstruction funding is going to be massive because so much is destroyed um, that um, the, these massive investments should uh, also really go to community organizations, cooperatives, local authorities uh, for green investment. And this should not just be loan based. My country, for example, the Netherlands thinks they can only give loans for commercial activities. Uh, to support the reconstruction in the Ukraine. That would, of course, be a very bad uh, approach. Um, and, um, and that we also, at the same time, need to understand that we need an innovative approach. We need to be very fast. The winter is coming in October, and there is entire cities without any heating at the moment, which need to be entirely reconstructed before the winter comes. Um, and it, this still needs inclusion, consultation, uh, and needs to be done in a sustainable manner. So that is quite a, quite a challenge, but uh, it can be done. Um, and we also looked at, um, and am I already over time? Yeah. I'm already over time. <laughs> a few more points. Um, broader, more broader, we looked at the issues of, uh, of uh, the, the frustration against um, those who are paying the bill, f as we discussed this morning as well, for the European Green Deal abroad. Yeah, that we're maybe focusing too much on do no harm just within the EU, but that we don't sufficiently take into account the harm which we are doing with, for example, mining for lithium and our electronic uh, transition. Um, and so that really needs to be a key point. And um, we need to really look at what are the alternatives which we are bringing as alternatives uh, to our partners globally. And um, there we need resource democracy. We support this super good proposal to have a target for the re reduction of raw material consumption. Um, and at the same time, we really need to keep what is good. For example, Ukraine has a much less pesticide use, much less fertilizer use, uh, has a much more sustainable agriculture at the moment. That needs to be kept and sustained. Um, so there's a lot so we discussed and much more we can discuss during the reception. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. I know this, the discussions are so rich that it's impossible to say everything, so that, but we've got lots of drinks at the reception. Now, last but certainly not least, we're going to have making zero pollution a reality. So to Vladka Matkovic from Heal. Thank you. Okay. I'll try to be brief. Uh, I know you're all uh, heated up. Uh, so thanks for, uh, uh, to all the participants, moderator, and uh, our presenters for this session. Can we move on? I think with this. Okay, so our session was about zero, making zero pollution a reality. So three years ago, we could only dream about this. And I wanna just mention this. Some dreams come true. We have actually zero pollution action plan. This is really hard. It was hard work and it, it felt like it will never come um, to the agenda, but actually there is uh, now. Um, so we have a zero pollution ambition. We can discuss if this is good enough or not, but at least there is. A preventive approach, targets uh, on air pollution and definitely stepping up uh, uh, implementation of exi existing legislation. These are the good points. And then what definitely we wanna discuss further are stricter standards um, or pollution prevention standards. So for all of the pollutants, not just air pollutants, chemicals, there, need, there is a big list that is uh, not even included in this. Um, zero pollution action plan um, and inclusion of emerging pollutants like basically having a mindset that there will be no more pollution like let's do economic uh, economic system without polluting first and then fighting against this pollution um, and uh, um, just to mention that if there is no evidence about the harm, this does not mean that there is no harm of certain pollutant. Uh, and we do have a principle, do no significant harm uh, already in a European Green Deal. So that's something. Um, although, of course, there needs to be definitions around that. Um, and in a green light, uh, no, actually, not green, but red light, 
a threat of false solutions. And for that, I mean nuclear, gas, biomass, in a, uh, renewables directive, and so on. Um, and some of the topics are totally missing or are in the back, back end of the of the, any kind of revisions, and these are the noise and lights. I put these slides not for you to read, but just to mention that uh, some of the directives um, for you to try to link your topic with zero pollution. So if you're working on climate, there is definitely a link, and we cannot be so much silos. So for example, in a renewables energy directive, there are some false solutions. It might be looking from, uh, from energy side uh, as a, a solution, but then from pollution side, it's definitely not, like biomass, for example, or hydro. Uh, wastewater, well, again, we need stricter standards in that and uh, yeah, others uh, too. Um, and putting polluter pay into practice with some of the directives and some of our legislation. So we have several of those. Some of you are working on one on the other. And flagging non-compliance through, through data. I will touch on those in, in my recommendations. So definitely we need integrated approach like climate and zero pollution go together or uh, decarbonization needs to go to depollution. Um, awareness about all pollution to oppose this really massive, powerful industry lobby. And uh, we need justice and compensation uh, for all affected people and environment as well. Uh, and one last thing is the role of science, which I want to flag here. So if we, for example, have a WH standards on air pollutants, and then negotiators are negotiating something that is not scientifically based, like we don't have, why are we, why are we saying uh, we have a, a standards? Why are we doing and uh, paying for the, for the science if we are not actually uh, then taking this into account. And on some other continents ex actually, like US, has uh, this better regulated, so maybe we can learn from them. And I think, thank you. Yeah, this is thank it. you. Right, thank you every, everyone for the presentations and the earlier facilitation and so on. We've got exactly minus one minute for any questions, so we won't have any. So keep them for the reception. Um, the only thing to say is that what we're going to do with all of this, we have the background paper. If you read it carefully, it was asking for inputs, and we're going to promise to do an update of it, try to integrate your views, and then hopefully use that to, uh, to encourage an upgrade in the ambition so that we can get the person on the moon that we wanted. Okay, so that's the end of this session. So a big round of applause again for the eight rapporteurs in this match. And now somewhere in the house is, is our next opening. Do we have the next panel? Yanis, is Yanis Potocznik in the room somewhere? Because I'd like to hand over the microphone so I can think about having another blue donut. <laughs> uh, here he comes, I think. And this is the last, please, Yanis. So we've upped the temperature just for you. It's very good. <laughs> so, uh, should I ask? Yeah, yeah. To come yes, sure. Okay. Fine. Can,
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends. It's good to be here, and I think this is the first moderation in my life. <laughs> or whatever, uh, doesn't matter. Really, uh, before I start, uh, so that I put the things in order. I'm here more or less from one reason. It's good to see you, everybody, but uh, uh, this is my eighth conference this week. And definitely, uh, Friday afternoon is not the best time to have it. But uh, I'm here uh, for, to pay a tribute to you, Jeremy, to everything you have done. Uh, I will not be at the reception later on, but uh, I would like to say that uh, I've heard that uh, your, you will, your, your legacy will be in good hands. But uh, I, I have really had the feeling that I was privileged as commissioner from two reasons, for creating really good friendship relations with some of you, and because I always felt that what I was doing is actually supported by an army of devoted people out there. And if you understand it in that way, it's always easier. So uh, that is just to thank you. and. Uh, just to say that, uh, really, uh, I do appreciate everything what you have done for me personally, but also for the course which we are all behind. But let me go now to European Green Deal. <laughs> so not many of you know, but uh, when I entered commission, um, this was the Barroso 1 and Barroso 2 commission, and uh, our political narrative at that time was growth and jobs. I have tried twice at the college meeting to introduce just one word to that, sustainable growth and jobs. But we stayed with growth and jobs. So we shouldn't un underestimate the message of European Green Deal. Uh, because it's the message which is actually for the first time in life telling us on such a level that Economic development is not in contradiction with environmental preservation. On the contrary, if we would follow the logic of the Club of Rome, which basically said that we have moved from the empty world, which was dominated by nature, to a full world, which is dominated now by humans, while in the empty world it was labor and infrastructure, which were the limiting factors of human well-being, it is now in full world, actually, environmental sinks and how we care for natural resources. So if you want to discuss economics, talk about nature. Because if you will not talk about nature, you have simply missed the point. Of course, you have to talk about social issues also. But all in all, we have created a kind of economic system which is simply looking at, uh, at, at people as external to nature and not part of it, which is a major mistake. Some of you uh, were actively connected and contributed also to something which we have released uh, two years ago. It was called uh, System Change Compass. It was Club of Rome and Systemic. I basically wear both hats. And uh, when we looked, the question which we asked ourselves at that time was a pretty simple question. It was uh, the question, OK, we have great vision, we have great targets in European Green Deal, but how to make it implementable? How is that possible? And we actually came to three conclusions that implementation is uncertain because it does not sufficiently address drivers and pressures that cause environmental damage, because it does not offer enough systemic perspective to guide decision making, and third, because implementation is put at the extra risk due to the COVID-19 recovery, and now we could add the consequences which are connected with the uh, Ukrainian war. And just recently, uh, uh, Jeremy, I brought a copy with, with myself because it was just fresh on my table, we released so-called International System Change Compass. Uh, the same two groups plus the Open Sciences Foundation. And the question which we asked ourselves there, was going one step further. So while in the first we were inward oriented, what we need to do, uh, in the second we basically asked if we 
met if we would meet the targets like decarbonization, uh, like decoupling, like just and fair transition. Everything that it's written in the famous sentences of European Green Deal, we will discuss what would be the international consequences. What would be the consequences on geopolitics? What would be the consequences on trade? Because there will be consequences. I don't know if, if majority is aware, but more than half of the trade in physical terms in shipping is with fossil fuels, which will be gone. So what will be the consequences on the shipping industry, but also on the relations with, of many countries which are connected to that? So, uh, and we have identified three major blind spots in the relation to this international story. The first one, is pretty much the same as we have identified before, so the lack of systemic approach. So if you look at, for example, in climate negotiations, they are fixating on GAG, but they don't look to the rest, but rest, unfortunately, also matters. If then the second is lack of natural resource management perspective. They look a lot through the energy management, which is absolutely essential and necessary, but without looking to the rest of natural resources, you do, as, you do a lot of trade-offs and, uh, and side effects which you will have to handle later. And finally, what we found, and I think this is in particular worrying, is the lack, uh, it's the focus on the supply side and entire lack of the focus on the, who it's actually consuming and who is basically surpassing planetary boundaries. There is zero targets in NDCs which would be about footprinting and who is actually behind that, uh, that questions. Which is, <coughs> sorry, which is uh, exactly the question which uh, Monique, I would like that we will discuss later. So, unfortunately, this question, it's putting in the center the fairness and equity. Because if you don't start talking that, don't look into the eyes of low-income countries, because currently they are consuming uh, 13, I have to be careful, not 13 times less, because that's not possible, because I was professor of statistics. So it is, we are consuming 13 times more than they are consuming per capita when, when it comes to that. So the question which we will ask ourselves today is how successful we were in first place European Commission with the promise to deliver a set of deeply transformative policies as we approach to the midpoint of the European Union five-year cycle and start to emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, it is really timely to reflect upon the progress made to deliver uh, on this promise. And the debate will provide an opportunity to discuss where the Green Deal has become a game changer for the better, where results have been mixed, and where it has simply disappointed. It will also, we will also try to reflect upon the implications, of course, of the terrible war which we are seeing in Ukraine, which has providing compelling reasons for actually accelerating the green transition and not the opposite to what is in reality sometimes happening. And at the same time, it has been also used, as you have uh, heard many times, as an excuse. So European role in wider world will also be discussed. So I have a great panel, starting with uh, Monique. Uh, Monique Goyans is uh, Director General BEUC, the European Consumer Organization, going to, uh, going to Tatiana, Secretary General Youth and Environment Europe and EEB board member. Then to Jorgo, Jorgo Ries, Director Greenpeace European Unit and current chair of the uh, G10. Uh, then Ludovic uh, uh, Voigt. Uh, Conf, uh, Confederal Secretary European Trade Union ETUC, which you know better and quicker. And uh, uh, finally, Petros Fazoulas, Secretary General European Movement International. And uh, the discussion will be led by me. And we are now entering into some questions which I will ask the, uh, the, uh, the, everybody who is in the panel which I would really like that they are focusing on in three to four minutes presentation at the beginning, and then, of course, we will open the floor for your questions. So, Monique, we will start with you. Uh, the interests of consumers and environmentalists often overlap. That's clear. But there are also situations where 
the, sometimes they may not coincide or where better performance of a product comes with some additional environmental cost. Is the consumer movement fully behind the European Green Deal? Is there some resistance? If it's the latter, how we could actually overcome it? And is the broader question of the overconsumption by the developed world seen as a relevant issue in the European consumer movement? Please. And I have two minutes to answer all these questions. <laughs> that, that's exactly, no, that's why I, we gave you three to four. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, but before I answer your question, I have an urgent message to the audience. Because at the last panel, at the last uh, session, we spoke, uh, a lady spoke, and I, I was in, in the back, so I cannot remember her name, and her, I think it's WWF, spoke about the tax vote and the, the request to you to write to your MEPs in order to give them the courage to veto the delegated act. Can I give you a lobby trick? Don't write to them because they will get thousands of letters. C communicate with them on Twitter. Tell them that you are watching them. Tell them that you would like them to respond on Twitter that yes, you will vote veto. I think it's really important to make a difference because there will be thousands of lobbyists who are just going to tell them not to veto. So really important. You can of course write a letter. It's never harming, but they will be overwhelmed by an exploding mailbox. This being said, so uh, it's really important because we only have two weeks to make a huge change, and it's now that we need to have. If, if it's not happening now, we will be for years and decades blocked in uh, fossil gas and nuclear energy as being green. So this is something that, as a consumer movement, we really support this veto to happen. So um, before answering the first question that you asked me, I also would like to say that it is underestimated, and as you mentioned it, always looking at the supply side, never looking at the demand side. But at the end of the day, any aspect of the green transition, be it energy, be it food, be it transport, be it consumption uh, overall, it will need to happen by the people. You and I, but also the people out there, or all those young people who are on TikTok and love fast fashion. And uh, we all have to change the way we, we, we live, uh, the way we eat, the way we move, the way we travel, the way we use or not use products, the way we heat our homes, the way we, uh, we, we use services rather than products. And if you don't deliver a policy, not you, but if there is not a policy being delivered that does not put the responsibility on the individual shoulder, we will fail. It will be a system st systemic failure. So from our perspective, it is really important to say Consumers must be supported. They are a, a unique part. They will make it happen. If they don't make it happen, it will fail. And that means that the sustainable option must always be the, the, the cheapest option, the affordable one. It must be easy to get, meaning not three years of waiting before you can put a solar panel on your, on your roof because the permitting procedure is just red tape. And it must be fun. Uh, it must not become a punishment to be a sustainable consumer. And I think that that's maybe the difference between a consumer organization and an environmental organization. Uh, we look at the consumer perspective and how can you mobilize consumers and uh, never tell them that's wrong what they're doing, but give them the possibility to do good. And uh, yes, we are. Ten years ago, I would have told you that we would not be behind the Green Deal. But there has been really a waking up of the consumer organizations, uh, realizing over the last years that we have a responsibility as consumer movement to be part of the solution. And rather than to just inform and be defensive, we have to educate consumers and we have to push the policymakers to uh, provide this win-win to the environment and to consumers. So we are fully behind the Green Deal. Uh, of course, we have, we have different, um, let's say, mis a different mission. And what we are, our messaging is always re um, related uh, to um, the fact that it's a double win for, uh, no, sometimes even a four times win. I don't know how you make that in statistics, but um, it's a win for, uh, for in the environment if the, if the policy is smart, but also for consumers because most of the time, if you have the courage to engage, you will be economically winning because it is cheaper to have an electric vehicle. It is cheaper to have a heat pump. It is cheaper to have an energy efficient house. But you need then to design a policy where the upfront investment is being supported, either by social policies, by fiscal policies, or whatever. And, um, and then the, the two other wins are um, health, of course, and quality of life, because uh, if you live in a better environment, you are a 
a happier consumer or person. And also sometimes the social dimension. So it's the poorer households that will be helped more if you, have, if you invest as a policymaker into full retrofitting policies. Because for them, the part of the energy bill that is related to heating, that is wasted because the house is not well insulated, is much higher. So they will be even uh, benefiting more. So uh, what I would like to say is that we try to coordinate we don't always agree. We agree on the direction with the environmental organization. Sometimes we don't agree on some of the nitty gritty, but we, well, that's the price we have to pay. We always try to, 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 to uh, highlight the positive sides. But where we can make a difference in the lobby work, in the advocacy work, is that we highlight always the consumer dimension. And then, um, and that makes a different way of lobbying. Some uh, policymakers who are not really sensitive to the environmental argument, they can be sensitive to the economic argument from the consumer side in terms of constituency. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks. I think we have heard, uh, I think that deserves applause. <laughs> I, th I think it, it has to be accessible and it has to be fun. And uh, I think it's pretty important that we start to understand that environmental transition is as much social transition than it's actually environmental. If we want really to get people behind and without people, it's really difficult to do changes. Tatiana, perhaps the main defining feature of uh, 2019 elections was the youth movement, who actually push so-called Green Wave, and it was largely attributed actually to your younger generation. And, uh, and do you feel that optimism and determination are winning over cynicism, which uh, in my generation prevails, to be honest, and despair within the youth movement? Do you feel that youth voice is being listened? or it's still, like Greta famously put it, predominantly blah, blah, blah. Is the youth movement generally more comfortable creating pressure from the streets or by sitting uh, close to negotiating tables? And the last question, which is the most difficult, can you promise us to be even more active in 2024? Thank you so much. Well, the last question is not the most difficult out of these. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for having me here. It's an honor for me to be in this panel. Um, do you hear me well? Am I holding the mic right? Okay, awesome. Thanks a lot. I had so much to say, so I had to make a, a bullet point list with the priorities. Maybe one day as, when I'm as experienced as uh, Mr. Potochnik in conferences, I will not need that. But I do apologize if I look too much down. Well, to your first question, um, I don't think that optimism prevails, unfortunately. I, the most profound and eye-opening op conversations that I had with my peers on how optimistic are you about where we're heading is when I, um, it took me some time, but I raised questions about having children with my peers. Obviously, this is not a question that you would normally discuss, and this is a personal choice for everyone, but it took me some time, and also because I'm now entering the stage in my life when I'm starting to think, am I going to have a family? Do I, am I going to have kids? How many kids? Do I have one less child? As we know, this is the way to, to decrease the, the environmental impact, right? So I opened this conversation with my colleagues in the office, and then I started to slowly talk about it with my peers in different settings. And, um, well, I had this plethora of feelings, mostly anxiety-related feelings about where we're heading, and myself knowingly bringing into this world someone who will experience the impacts um, and the results of the decisions that have been made in the past 30 years or maybe 40 years, right? Um, and I found that... I'm not the only one. So if you want to know, perhaps asking the young people that you have around, what do they think? How do they feel about bringing children into this and, and having them inherit this planet and the state that it's going to be? Um, ask them. And we are already experiencing the impacts, right? Uh, for example, I just had a chat with my colleague uh, the other day, and her younger sister is now in Benin in West Africa. And she says, I just want to go for a walk in the park, and I can't because it's too hot. So just imagine where we're heading with this and young people perhaps not being able to practice normal things that we are used to so much in some, in some countries, in some parts of the world. To your second question, do I feel whether the youth voice is being heard? Well, my job is literally to 
inspire and convince as many young people as possible that their voices actually count, so you perhaps won't, won't hear me saying that no. But I do truly believe that young people have a say and their voice is being heard and it counts. But the thing is the expense um, through which this is being heard. Um, I just wanted to mention that sometimes our one big thing that we all experience as young people is our expertise being doubted regularly in the civil society meetings and the meetings with decision makers everywhere. And we really have to stand our um, belief in ourselves, our self-efficacy, knowing that we are already experts in some things. And uh, I've experienced so many situations when I just had, to, when I listened uh, adults or people representing adult organizations saying, we need an expert on how to draft a call for young people to join this event. Do you know someone looking me in the eyes. Well, I know I do it every day. Um, so, yeah, we have to stand our ground. And it has to, it takes toll on young people. How are we supposed to build our self-efficacy? How are we supposed to know that we actually can do stuff? And I think this is where youth organizations, youth-led organizations do play a big role. For example, at YE, we know we recently did our psychological safety assessment with an expert, and we know for a fact that we have the safe space where young people actually can get empowered and voice their ideas and just know that they're worth something and that their opinion matters. And to the third question, and then I will quickly answer the fourth one. This one is not that difficult. So is the youth movement generally more comfortable voicing their, vo uh, voicing their opinions from the streets and rather, participating, rather than participating in the negotiations? Well, we know that to be successful advocates, we need to master three elements. These are mobilization, communication, and policy. And obviously, mobilization has been an important part, and you've all noticed it. And if you've joined the strikes or mobilization actions, thank you so much. This is very important. Now, um, I also understand that there is a flip side to it. Some of the decision makers or perhaps people in suits who are making decisions on uh, where they're going to spend the millions, uh, which lobby area is the, is the best one for this year. They would see young people as these angry activists who are skipping schools and breaking into meetings, annual meetings. Um, but you would be surprised how many of young people are actually intelligent and, and intelligent and tactful to be in those negotiation processes. And they're willing, there is a huge interest to give opinions and to participate in decision making, policy making in the room, in the negotiation room. Again, this is not for free. You usually have to travel somewhere. You have to take time off from school. You have to uh, pay your accommodation in a sort of way. And this is something that we're struggling with. But then there is a huge interest. We've done uh, the first big uh, policy-related project we've done was in 2020 for the Franco-Russian dialogue, where 50 participants were writing proposals for their governments for the next 20 years. And we wanted 50 participants, we got 120. And we see that there is a will to do that. It's just the question of resources. And the last question, well, no, because election is too late. The election time is too late to mobilize young people. So we're trying to do it consistently and um, follow the promises and follow the policy uh, discussions all the time and not just in front of the election time. Thank you, Tatiana. <laughs> comments, you certainly don't need paper, uh, because you speak very fluently. <laughs> and uh, second, it's an advice, uh, stay optimistic, because optimists live better and longer. Uh, then, uh, Jorgo, you, we are coming to you. Um, apart from being the current chair of G10, longest serving director of the G10 member organization, so you have seen many of us, to put it like that, uh, commission presidents, environment commissioners, and so on. So you have seen how the policy was evaluated. What was the, what were the major factor of factors of success? You could where, where you could say these are the things which function well, and uh, which are the major things where you think that they were not leading to the results as you would wish, so, so basically failures. What can we learn from this, uh, how we can in the future influence on the positive change? Well, thank you very much for that question, and thank you very much for the invitation to join you. Um, the question sounds like you're asking me for a recipe, 
what have I seen working. And the reason why I'm still here after more than 20 years now is I haven't figured out the recipe. <laughs> uh, I'm trying with my colleagues uh, every month, every year. I think it's because the context changes so frequently, not every day, but certainly every couple of years, and not just in Europe, but globally. And the opportunity has come, and then they go, and then they come in a new guise. So it's really this adapting and identifying at this time, what is the issue where we have critical mass, where we can make a big headway. Um, but if I was supposed to sort of try to sum it up anyway, <laughs> I would say, think of the three H's, the head, the heart, and the hand. And by that I mean, when I say the head, I mean, is our perception of the problem, how widely is that shared, and by how many different types of players is the perception of the problem shared? How well is the solution that we're promoting understood? That's the head. A lot of energy goes into that, and I'll, I'll come to that sort of in my short wrap-up. By the hand, I really mean the different players, the Green 10 for the environmental movement, certain businesses, academics, politicians, broader movements, other interest groups. How many people have an interest in this? And not just, an, not just a mental interest, how many people will benefit from this, either economically or in terms of their everyday life. How many people really have a reason to go for it? How many people really want it? How many people really want it badly? That's the hand. Those are the people who really will go for it and will not pull back when the first resistance comes or, or when things are not moving as fast as they wanted to. So how strong is that hand? And then third one is the heart. And that was certainly much stronger, I felt, when I started in Brussels um, at the turn of the century, I'm making it sound really old because you're sort of playing on my being around, having been around for so long. Um, so the, the, the pure sense that this is the right thing to do and what's happening is an outrage and what we can go for is, is going to be so much better, that kind of emotional passion. I've seen over the years, certainly also in the environmental movement, and I guess more broadly, the analytical capacities, the staff in order to analyze and strategize increase. The Commission has always been very strong on that part, fairly weak on this one, certainly in my interactions, and I think that's, that's crucial. If you don't have that, if you're trying to go from an intellectual analysis of this is the problem and here's the solution and let's get 12 different players together, in my experience, you're, you're lacking something crucial. So to sum it up, the, the head part is where I feel we've often put in so much effort, so much energy, and sometimes I was, I felt, shit, you know, can we not get more into the heart and in the hand? But then we have, you know, we have the status quo players who don't want change, and they throw around all these arguments to just blur things and to confuse things and to just, and this is a lot of stuff is reactive then. We're trying to sort out the argument again and again. The facts are clear. In a way, the problem is clear, the solution is clear, and yet again, you need to put so much energy into this. So these three points, you've pointed on, on other three elements, and I think sort of it mine, what I would say goes very well along together with this. You know, you have to have the mobilization out there. You need to have people who can analyze the policies and who can push it. But to say it very simply, I'd say, if you've got the hand, head, if you've got the heart and the hand, then go for it. If one of these is lacking, keep working on it, but you're not there, and you're not yet ready to make that whole of society mo transition mobilization. Thank you. Thanks. Just, just to say from my own experience, uh, G10 is extremely important. And uh, if, if you are not critical to those who are in political positions like I was, then you are not ahead of time. Then you are behind the time. And if you are behind the time, you are not doing your job. So you have to do that. And uh, in my context, uh, what makes the things working was the lesson which I learned. Repeat, 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 repeat. And when you are totally fed up of repeating, repeat it again. 
because otherwise it's not going nowhere. Ludovic, trade unions. I think it is widely acknowledged that uh, transition must be just. And uh, not only because it's right, but because simply it will not happen if it's not done in that way. And also the European Green Deal is pretty explicit in that uh, context. So my question to you would be pretty much the same as it was to Monique before, uh, because in a certain way you, you have the, the same optic uh, from a bit different kind of perspective. Uh, but does the trade union movement broadly support the European Green Deal? What are the concerns? Valid or not valid? Needed to be addressed? And how, how, can, we do it? how can we help? Thank you, and uh, happy to be with you also, uh, even if it's uh, quite hot in here. Uh, the already existing uh, climate change is quite clear, so yes, we support uh, the objectives uh, that are to go to uh, carbon neutral um, uh, society and the pathway to go there. The question is, of course, the how, and uh, because the transition can happen, the question is, how can it be just? And so behind this question, I think, is how do we build the trust and confidence of people do you hear me well? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, how do we build the trust and confidence on people in the transition? That's not the first transition that we live, so uh, we can also experience the uh, previous transition. I think the poorest in, in society, the most vulnerable workers, have already experienced transitions where, where they have been left behind. Uh, so uh, if we look at the globalization trend, there has been massive destruction of jobs uh, all over Europe, in, uh, here in the region, in Wallonia, in Belgium, uh, in the south, massive destruction of industrial jobs. Uh, so I think behind the discussion about the climate transition, where of course there uh, it's important to do this transition because also the most vulnerable are the most affected, uh, but uh, in the question of how and uh, of the transition, we have to make sure that uh, there's a future for everyone. And there, of course, any, any climate policy is not an equalizer, uh, is not producing just transition. It can also uh, increase uh, inequalities. Uh, and in this transition, to build the trust, uh, okay, we can uh, state that there are principles like energy savings, for sure, but when you go to in-depth uh, in uh, policies on energy savings, uh, there's no confidence if, uh, if someone is uh, renting a house that the owner would not raise the price of his house. So the question is the how of the uh, policies. If we take a climate policy that is quite coherent to ban combustion engine vehicles, quite coherent, climately speaking. What does it mean in terms of job in the automotive sector? What does it mean in terms of perspective for the workers in the sector? Uh, will it mean less jobs? In that case, if we don't speak about working time reduction, what does it mean in terms of, ma of job destruction? Or uh, also in terms of uh, inequalities between the uh, East and the West, because one of the uh, danger of uh, electrification is that uh, Germany would get a lot of jobs uh, maintained, but all the uh, supply chain in the East uh, would uh, lose a lot of jobs in the autom automotive sector. So the question uh, that the trade unions are trying to bring in the climate policies is we have to look at each single policy and anticipate the, uh, tr uh, their effect on, uh, on social, the social effects. Here we think the Fit for 55 package is not doing this properly at the moment. It's still possible to improve it, but uh, if you look at each of the uh, policies of the Fit for 55 package, there's no anticipation of the change in jobs, there's no anticipation of the change in skills, uh, there's no uh, the, the framework to concretely invest in job creation in the regions that will be affected, the, the challenge of uh, yeah, uh, training people for the jobs of tomorrow, allowing public investment, public services, etc., is not addressed properly yet. So that's why we ask as trade union movement to be able to support concretely the Green Deal and the Fit for 55 package to also establish a just transition framework that complements this uh, Fit for 55 package. Because just transition cannot just be a limited fund uh, to finance the transition in some regions on, uh, uh, in the carbon regions. It should be uh, a, a pathway, a policy uh, that is integrated completely in the European Green Deal. And uh, this is the only way that on the long term uh, we will not get any uh, yeah, 
pushbacks uh, from uh, workers because from unions we have confidence that we can, if uh, we, are co uh, we have the correct framework, we are quite confident as a collective organization that we can also influence this through anticipation of change, by negotiating with employers, by pushing also uh, member states to deliver. But workers alone, if they uh, lose their jobs, they might also turn their back uh, to the climate policies and as collective our collective responsibility is to make sure that this doesn't happen and that they do not vote for those who will tell them that we can continue exploiting the nature and that they will continue to have jobs uh, at any price. So, yeah, this is what we, uh, Australian movement, would like to bring in the climate discussions. Having a just transition framework is as important as having climate targets because if it's, uh, we do not have this transition framework, at the same level of ambition as the climate targets, then uh, this will not happen. Actually, I have nothing to add. Uh, the only thing which I would say maybe is that looking only through the climate targets, it's a bit missing the, the whole story because it's more than climate targets. But uh, today the bias is really very much on the climate story. And, uh, and I, I do remember that in the International Resource Panel, which I'm co-chairing, we have done a kind of analysis already 10 years ago, what, what is the impact of the renewable energy and non-renewable energy. And when you look to GNG, to health, it's, it's straightforward. But when you look to the resource use, to materials, it's just the opposite. So I'm not saying that we should not do that. I'm just saying do it in a way that we don't create uh, additional different problems. And this is sometimes simply not part of the discussion. But Petros, uh, how every good moderator should say last but not least. <laughs> so uh, since uh, founded in 1948, European movement has been behind the progressive strengthening of European institutions. And uh, that steadily increased the uh, EU's decision-making powers, closely linked to the story of environmental protection in Europe. How do you see that link between more or less Europe debate, achieving European laws, policies, and lifestyles that respect planetary boundaries? Because when we talk about environment, it's quite a lot of power, actually, on the European Union level. And to what extent the various kind of setbacks, Brexit is the typical one, uh, could actually hamper the green transition. Has the increased focus on environmental issues made the idea of stronger Europe more attractive to citizens? Has the conference on the future of Europe, where you've been represented in the plenary, a useful exercise? I would uh, rather not ask you the last question because this is enough for three to four minutes. <laughs> no, so uh, seriously looking ahead, how do you think that the current this geopolitical climate in which we are living could impact on this European study? Thank you very much indeed. And I'm painfully aware that it's a Friday afternoon. You guys have been working hard all day. We are probably the only thing standing between you and some drinks. Well, there's also the closing remarks, but we all know Jeremy doesn't have much to say anyway, so that should be quick. But seriously, on the exam questions, um, I think that the debate around more or less Europe is in effect a shorthand, is a code language for those that want to take away our rights, our freedoms, and the protections that are afforded by what they call regulation. And this is why it's very important to ensure that uh, we fight back on that narrative. Because they usually build up the European Union as that boogeyman that is there to do a lot of good. And then they come to our fellow citizens and say, don't you worry, there will be less of this if you vote for us or if you vote for this referendum. So it is important to ensure that we always speak about Europe, or not as a regulator, but as uh, that entity that confers and protects rights and is there to make our society, our economy, our products and our environment fit for us to live in. Uh, and that's why I'm always very keen to ensure that when we talk about Europe, we present it in those terms. Now, this, these same people uh, were the ones that campaigned for the UK to leave the EU and they successfully managed to apply exactly those tricks. 
because in many ways uh, the vote that uh, resulted uh, a few years ago was very much about that. You know, how can we leave something that has been painted as so negative that we don't want to be part of it? And it has been a blow, certainly has been a blow. We're seeing already uh, the effects in the UK where deregulation is becoming the norm, where environmental protections are stripped away, where the current government is really keen to do more damage than good, even though there are also some parts of the government that are very much in favor of environmental protections, but I'm very concerned about what the future has to hold. Of course, there are some opportunities too. The UK was often an awkward partner. They didn't like that idea of too much EU rules, and maybe not having them in the room has made it easier to adopt certain things, like some of the things we discussed. But I think in the greater scheme of things, having a heavily deregulating, polluting neighbor across the channel is certainly bad for the cause you all serve over here. Now, on uh, generally the question of uh, whether the need for greater environmental protection has also reminded people that we can only do this if we pull together. That is the case. I think one comes with the other, and that's where also the environmental movement with the European movement are very much aligned. And, and this is why we have been building partnerships, and Jeremy has been visionary in that regard, bringing the European Environmental Bureau within the European Movement Network. Uh, I mean, Patricia is on our board, and she always uh, makes the point of the close alignment between the two. So I do believe that uh, the cause of the, the environmental cause is very much similar to the one of, that we advocate, of a closer cooperation to address the challenges that our citizens are facing across the board and certainly on the environment. On the Conference of the Future of Europe, uh, my kids will tell you it was a really annoying thing because I was gone so long in Strasbourg, and I have to admit that it really was an inconvenience for me too. But in the substance, uh, and I was uh, skeptical at the beginning, especially because of the travel, I think it really provided us with the opportunity to experiment with a completely new way of taking decisions. Now, this was an experiment. It hasn't yet come to anything. We, the proof is in the pudding. The Commission today came forward with some recommendations. The Council, EU leaders will be discussing this next week. And the rest of us are very much active in that area to make sure that what was adopted as recommendations become also a reality. But having citizens pa being part of this decision-making process at the European level, having civil society, again, Patricia also was there with us, uh, contributing constructively in that process really changed the frame, and we, and we saw that across the board. I think we have a unique opportunity to really strengthen and redesign our democracy, and we should not let the imperfections in the design of the process deter us. We should really build on it, learn from the lessons we all picked up, and really do more to make sure that our democracy is participatory, participatory deliberative, and very much closer to the citizens. And as for, for the last thing about the, the challenges we face, we should be under no illusion. The, what's happening in Ukraine, uh, the pandemic, the, the rise of illiberal uh, regimes, there is a challenge to everything that we hold dear. Civil society at large, those that work for the European project, uh, we are facing an existential crisis. Not just our environment, our whole political system, our democracy is under threat. There are people within our continent, next to our continent, beyond our continent, who don't share our view of the world, who don't share our values, who in fact would like to put in place a completely different system that will do away with everything that we consider dear. So we need to pull together, we need to build alliances, and we need to do the most we can to defend our democracy, our environment, and the way we are imagining the future for ourselves and for our kids. And I think that's why it's very important that what the European Environmental Bureau is doing, the whole green movement, that we strengthen it and we are shareholders of it and we work together. Thank you very much. And a lot of nice and encouraging messages. The only thing which I would correct you is Actually, it's not you who is standing between them and drinks, but only me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, looking at you, um, so I basically played a classical moderator, which means that we have shortened the Q&A time as much as we can. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, certainly we have some time also for the questions. 
looking, uh, we will certainly not prolong it uh, because looking at you, I have just a feeling either the COVID is everywhere or it's really hot. <laughs> or both. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, is anybody taking care of the micro? Yeah, sure, super. So it's time to ask the question, please just say who you are. Uh, we more or less know each other, but anyway, it's decent. And if you have the question which is devoted to a specific person or you would like anybody to address it, please. The floor is opened. Heather. Thank you. It's Heather Gravy from Open Society Foundations. So I have to challenge Monique, who's in a little bit, because as a, as a great comrade in arms on many issues, I think it's very important you gave us this reality check that consumers need the solutions to be cheaper, easier, and more fun. Okay, because that's exactly what the counter movement is offering them. Fast food, fast fashion, fast fuel, all of them are offering exactly that at the moment, and the whole point of this panel is how do we move to a system where the, the sustainable alternatives are, are cheaper and faster. And typically in a business conference, people say, no problem, technology will do that. Just give us the investment, public investment please, we'll create the technology and all this will happen by magic. So how can we harness consumer power to push in the opposite direction? consumer demand to force companies to offer the sustainable solutions so that fast, uh, cheap, and fun uh, is, and sustainable are four categories that consumers ask for rather than three. And I know that's a tall order and it's political as well, but that has happened on occasion, particularly the youth dimension the younger generation. Look at how uh, people under the age of 25 think first about, often, about buying vintage, buying second hand. So consumers voting with their buying power can be extremely powerful, and it has been in a number of areas. But how do we move the consumer movement faster in that direction? Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, I see the hands popping up, but I would prefer just, if the question is specific and goes to the person, <laughs> that it's answered, but be please uh, yeah. straight to the point and short so that we can then continue, please. Uh, I think there has been a change in consumer attitude. Um, so there is a difference between attitude and behavior. Uh, every survey shows that a majority of consumers want to live more sustainably, but that they don't see, that they have faced a lot of barriers. So as a policymaker, you need to work on the barriers. And that can be with, uh, the, the, the price signal is one of them, so it's very important. That's one point I would like to say, so you need to develop a, a policy there. It can be with uh, plenty, better information, get rid of greenwashing, this is a horrible thing. Carbon neutral doesn't exist in real life, so stop carbon neutral advertising, for example, just to give an example. <laughs> what I also would like to say is um, be aware of the bubble. Because there might be young people who are like aware like uh, Tatiana, uh, but there are millions and billions of young people who just don't care, who go for the, f uh, for the junk food, who go for fast fashion. So there is also, and what we need is not the niche, if I can say it, it's, not, it's more than a niche maybe, but uh, to, to be aware, but it's to engage with the critical mass. And that's, it's a challenge, and I don't have a response to that, but we should be working together in order to find solutions. I agree with you, thank you. Thank you. Next question there. Uh, sorry, uh, do you have the micro? No, then uh, we will go with you because okay, it will be thank you. quicker and then the micro should go left. Please. Hi, I'm David Sabadin, also working at EEB. Just a question for Petrus. Um, uh, from your perspective, I mean, uh, I mean, so far we've seen, as you, as you mentioned also, uh, the growth of uh, environmental uh, concerns and also environmental policies together with the growth of an idea of a stronger Europe. You said it's between two, uh, there have been two phenomena that kind of uh, went, uh, grew, uh, grew together. But we're also now witnessing uh, some populist movements that are using environment as an argument against Europe. Uh, these bureaucrats that want to take away our fuel cars, these bureaucrats that want to impose you when to refurbish your house, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is this really something that's happening according to your experience and again, from your perspective, what could be the possible answer to that? Please. 
Yes, indeed. No, that, I, I do believe this is happening a lot, and it goes hand to hand. You see, the, this kind of narrative is usually driven by the same people who advocate illiberal democracy, as they call it, or the like. And I think it's very important for us to address this head on, because if by any chance they are successful in making that negative correlation in the minds or the subconscious of our fellow citizens and our voters, that could be the end both of the European project, but also of uh, all the efforts we are doing to strengthen environmental protections. And, and again, the, the role of civil society in that regard is huge because we are very close to citizens. We are often trusted messengers and ambassadors, and we need to articulate the fact that uh, this false narrative doesn't apply to reality. In fact, like it was said, those environmental protections are there to make life better for people, cheaper, more affordable, and make sure that you know, our fellow citizens can have the kind of life that we're really uh, advocating. So I think the, the challenge is enormous. As I said at the very end of my intervention, we, we are at this inflection point where if we are not able to deflect that kind of narrative, we will really suffer and lose everything that we hold dear. Thank you. Please. Thank you. <clears throat> Magda Sto is it on? Magda yeah. Stoczkiewicz, uh, Greenpeace, formerly Friends of the Earth Europe. Hello, Janis. It's been Hi. some time. It's been some time um, yes. I want to try to reconcile, I think, this question about cheap products uh, and environmental products. When the system changed in Poland, I was 19, and uh, we moved from the uh, had economy kind of communist economy to single to or free market and it took me some time to understand that free market doesn't exist because there is always somewhere money who pays someone pays to somebody for something or someone else pays as uh, externalities so as long as we are not gonna tackle the subsidies and externalities the environmental things will be more expensive so that's one point the second point is the social aspect. We have to take care of it. And the third point is the environment. We have one planet. And this is what was the core of the sustainability. What is sustainability? It's three pillars, environmental, in, uh, social, and uh, economic, which work together. And we are not there. After all these years, what is it now since uh, Rio de Janeiro, um, 40 years or so? 30? 30. 30, but limits to growth are 50. E yes, and we are still not there. So I think if we all start talking about money and reconciling that wrong assumption that environmental things are more expensive, then I think we can get somewhere. I started with C Bank Watch, always follow the money, then you will understand who is there and who pulls the strings. So that's a question to all of you, to what extent you see the reconcil reconciliation, but really demanding that these things are put properly and properly accounted for. Thank you. Be brief and quick, because we should slowly wrap up. Um, who wants to address that question? If sure. we don't want to monopolize. Everybody is free to answer. I'm, I, I'm totally convinced that, you ha that we can debunk a lot of those myths that living sustainably is more expensive, really. Uh, if you get away from meat, you, you can really already get a lot of your budget back and to eat delicious vegetarian food. You don't need to do it every day, but you can still uh, uh, you know, back down on meat, and that's a big part of the budget. Uh, if you, uh, instead of going to Thailand for Christmas and you stay local, it's also a big part of your budget that you can spend tremendous holidays uh, locally, and that's also another way of, of spending less money without, uh, with a, a lesser footprint on the, on, on the environment. So there's a lot that can be done. If you are not living in Thailand, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, one further thought on this point. Um, to what extent policymakers in the European Commission fall for the industry answer will provide you the type of solutions through technology. I think that's where I have a fundamental problem with the European project and this call to say because there is an attack you know, in Ukraine and because they're illiberal leaders, we must defend the European project. 
Because if the European project means what the European Commission and the European institutions are currently putting forward, how it is often presented by them and they try to capture it, then we have here basically a European Green Deal that intends within the existing framework with a financial system set up in the 20th century for an exploitative uh, 20th century economy to address problems that cannot be addressed by this system and to green it from within and to shift from one product to another and thereby somehow manage to become sustainable is simply bullshit in my view. And von der Leyen and her people need to be called out on it. They've gotten better in their communications, in their policies, they've become worse, I feel. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. The last, please. Uh, and then we will, uh, we have to wrap up, so. Uh, I would love to continue, I have no problem, but uh, I'm just, okay, we will, I, I got the signal that I can continue. Please. Yeah. It is, it's fine. Now it's on, yeah. Uh, Michael Carlson, uh, previous EB president, I wanted to go back to the actually the theme for this session and ask uh, Ludovic, uh, what can environmental organizations do nationally uh, in order to help mobilizing and bring workers and trade unions uh, on board in fostering a, a Green Deal? Thank you, Michael. Yeah, not easy. Um, I, I think, and that was also an answer I would like to bring to other questions. I think we have to repoliticize the debate on climate change also. We have to bring the question of inequalities uh, here uh, because it's not only, it was said, uh, it's not uh, by technologies that we will resolve. Uh, technology can help, but inequalities are at the center of uh, the, cl uh, the climate crisis. Uh, we have a Fit for 55 package which, which is based on market mechanism. So the question of prices it will go through prices for the moment, so if we want to change this, uh, this is not at, as it is done uh, yet that it should be uh, addressed. And there, then it means if we want to repoliticize the debate, we have also to bring the responsibility of employers in the discussion. So not only saying to member states you have to deliver plans to decarbonate, etc. Of course we have to do this and, uh, and we all try to uh, convince member states uh, to address this, but this cannot be done by just uh, begging employers that they will have decarbonation pathways by giving them money to do this. Uh, we need to anticipate the change, we need to plan the change, so it means that they have to be responsible for changing how they produce. Uh, and yeah, uh, so if uh, environmental movement can also bring this uh, dimension where unions are able, of course, then in uh, the sectors, uh, in the companies to also bargain with the, uh, the companies to implement this change, and this would help. But this is clear for us that also, um, yeah, if Total is continuing to do 14 billion benefit a year, it is impossible that it's not at the expense of the workers and at the expense of the nature. So. Thanks a lot. A lot. Please, this is. Please don't. Uh, Thank you very much. These are the last two, and then I'm finishing. Okay. Great and panel, we, we Thomas. Don't. Just questions, please. Thomas Arnold, advisor, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, DG Research and Innovation. Conciliating the planetary emergency at large with uh, the social uh, ambition. Is it possible to do this without boldly uh, enhancing uh, equality? And how far would we have to go in reducing inequalities within countries and globally? Thank you. Very Easy, short. very short. Yes. So, <laughs> if, if you have one hour, we can answer. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you see, the answer was even shorter. Anybody wants to comment? But yes. Yeah. 
sure. I think it's really the reverse. Uh, you should really um, um, prioritize uh, the poor. And we have seen that in the rollout of the energy response, you know, like uh, the high the volatility of energy prices, some member states like Belgium, they have given 100 euro vouchers to everybody, also those who don't just need it. And that's the wrong signal. You really need to help the people where they need it, when they need it, and how they need it. Yes. And the last question, please. Ah, uh, there we go. It was already on. Uh, thank you. My name is Laura, also from the EV, but I'm also kind of speaking maybe more as a young person. My question is to Tatiana. Um, I think in the discussion there was quite a lot of focus on consumers, and I sometimes get a bit the impression that there's an unbalanced shift on consumers to be the one who, who drive the change. Of course, we need consumers, but I think it often puts the expectation um, in a somewhat unfair on consumers, and especially on young consumers. I think there's this expectation for young people to be the ones loud on the streets to call for the change, for young people to be the perfect shining example of what a sustainable consumer and a conscious consumer looks like. And um, I think there can be the sense of frustration also then building up that you as a young person, you're doing so, you're kind of trying to do everything you can by volunteering, by doing a lot of work in this field. You're trying to do your consumption patterns also there, but then you're just faced with these extreme uh, injustices and inequalities. So my question is more to Tatiana is as to how you also see this and where you maybe see opportunities for, um, for us to shift a little bit more this debate and yeah, if this is a sentiment that you share. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Yes, indeed, you do all of these things. You do the maximum you can as an individual and then you end up in a sharing circle with your peers saying how bad you feel that nothing is still changing. So something is wrong over here. It's not working on the personal level, right? We are very aware that consumer responsibility, carbon footprint, these are the labeled terms that were not designed in our favor. We are aware that we need a system change and not just a change on the personal level. And we, for instance, want to take trains and not pay all the money that we have for the trains because we pay 20 euros for a flight, but then nobody's paying the externalities, right? That's what we truly want. So everything that we do in YE is actually designed for system change. You see, I told you that you don't need paper. Uh, uh, I have to conclude the session. It was a very nice session. I will just try to draw some conclusions because that's supposed what the moderator should do. In the first place, um, one message which I think stays with us, which is very clear, is that we have to build the trust in transition. So everybody who was here was basically speaking about that. The only thing which I would add when we talk about fairness, equality, trust, fairness, equality doesn't stop on our borders. We are living in the world where we are privileged. And if we will disregard that fact and look inwards instead of looking outwards, we will remain out of the reality. That's the first. Second, uh, indeed, consumers are extremely powerful, but if we are honest to ourselves, consumers are today heavily manipulated by capital. If you don't believe me, open the TV tonight and you, you will immediately see that that's the fact. So, in one hand, it's, uh, we, we are living in a we have created an economic system which, has, which is systematically in, in balance. So we have, obviously, because we have still too much poor people even in the high-income countries, we are obviously undervaluing labor and not valuing nature, and we live in market economies. And if you look to the data, according to data, um, Natural capital was undervalued in the last 20 years, approximately 40%. Which means that actually we are recording GDP growth while we are indebting future generations. And this should stop. And it's, uh, I think it's, 
Imagine that you are a customer which is going to the food center and you take the food from the shelves and go home and don't pay it. Do you think that that customer center would not get bankrupt? And that's exactly what we are doing to nature. So we go there, we take it, we pocket it, and that's it. And we think it will not get bankrupt. It will get bankrupt. And uh, what we are currently doing is that on the short term, with rational behavior based on signals which are in the long term leading us to irrationality, we are all somehow trapped in something which uh, Finnish author Arto Passerina titled in his novel, Charming Mass Suicide. It's actually suicide while you enjoy. So we need to tap into those uncomfortable things. So sending or, or whatever commission or any other body wants to bring a regulation on the table, which is responsible, good. As long as you have regulation which is trying to defend public interest, while the market seeks, so sending you here, while the market signals are actually sending you here, the result is confusion on the markets, a lot of lobbying and uncomfortable situation among producers, and of course also lots of confused consumers who are by definition asked to pay more if they act responsibly. So with that, it's really difficult to see the way out. And we simply need to go to some of the core reasons which we have created, because these are the essential reasons why we are where we are. And fixing the wrong or cleaning the wrong economic supply system will simply not do the trick. It's necessary and needed, but it's not enough. Next thing which, so simply, what I want to say is ignoring the wastefulness of our production and consumption system it simply, should simply end. And we should, with economic systems in which we are living, we sh it's time that we put back in the center humans. Currently what we are doing, and also measuring, it's maximizing the amount of products on the markets, or on, so which are produced and put on the market. We are not maximizing and following human needs, actually. So if I give you just one simple example, which you will all immediately understand. In these last two years of COVID, I don't know how it's with you, but I have used less than 10% of the clothes I would use if I would go publicly which means that I was actually using my clothes as human need, not as I will meet tomorrow that one, oh, I can't be two days in the same, oh, and that, which of course has consequences. But actually, I feel very nice in these jeans and I feel comfortable, and that's it. And I actually feel much more comfortable than in the garden dress which I would need to wear according to the rules. So, these are human needs, and human needs are those who need to be in center. And we simply need to be, we, we need to maximize that, we need to maximize well-being, not the amount of things which we simply put on our markets. So, in short, we need to move from efficiency to sufficiency, or better to say, complement efficiency with sufficiency policies. And the last two things, uh, one clear thing for everybody, and we have heard it also today from the discussion, is that while we are in these challenges which we are currently facing, so prescribing painkillers to heal the things which we are currently facing as the challenges which we are facing, acute diseases, will not heal the chronic diseases in which we are. And we are all dealing with the chronic disease, actually. So, it's, it's fundamental that when we deal with that, that we don't stop taking the medicines for chronic disease, otherwise it will, we will go bust, because that's how the things work. So doing that simultaneously is the only and the best way of our defense 
against any future crisis, be it environmental, be it economic, be it uh, geopolitical, be it whatever you want. But that's the only thing on which we have really to work. And, and finally, standards and behavioral patterns which we are today enjoying were, if we are honest, built in high-income countries. And we are those who have consumed the positive effects. So if somebody would say that we are not responsible to change and lead the change, that's not a really responsible statement. We are those who have to do that. And we have to lead the way. But that doesn't mean, so while the responsibility for the past is clear, that doesn't mean that the responsibility for the future is not joint and mutual. And that anybody is given a clear signal that you can do and repeat some of the stupidities which we have learned. And many of those were done without us knowing that we are doing the damage, or our parents. But we know now. So this is not giving anybody a blank chart that it could continue with the things which are simply damaging. So in one sentence, uh, which I'm repeating now constantly in the conferences, if we want to avoid extinction of elephants in nature, we have to extinct elephants in our rooms. Thank you. You have been an excellent audience. Thank you to all of you for this. Uh, and uh, Jeremy, thank you again. And have a nice weekend and take care. We are soon ending today's conference, a conference that I think has been very interesting and, um, well, I think we can conclude that there has been quite some positive changes over the last years, but there is still so much more to do. And uh, the positive change we have seen is, of course, uh, a result of hard work from many people, and uh, one of them is our Secretary General, Jeremy, who has been with the EB for 11 years, but before that in the environmental movement for, I don't know, all your life perhaps. <laughs> and uh, so now I have the pleasure to invite Jeremy to this place and um, give the floor to, to Jeremy and to give his reflections in a longer view of uh, successes and failures of the past and challenges of the future. Jeremy. Thank you, Johanna. Um, I'm really hot, or else I've got COVID. <laughs> I don't know what you thought about Yanis's joke. I thought it was a bit edgy, but yeah, anyway. Um, I don't think I've got COVID, but I am hot. And, and now we really are getting close to the point of being, you know, we're the only ones between you and the reception. So I'm feeling the pressure. Uh, and for that reason, I've sort of decided to skip the 45-minute synthesis, uh, the highlights of my forthcoming book on a thousand and one things that are wrong with European environmental politics and how to fix them. So you'll have to wait in suspense to, to get that. Um, and I'll just give you a, a, a synthesis of the synthesis. There is no book, by the way. Um, <laughs> not yet. Um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've come an awfully long way um, in the decades since the inse inception of the EEC in environment policy. And if we consider how much has been done uh, in that time, uh, we can be impressed. Uh, several decades uh, building up environmental policies, moving from a time when actually uh, environmental regulation was only seen as necessary to enable the functioning of the, of the single market to a point where environmental protection be became something in, in its own right, and then an increasingly um, comprehensive set of laws and policies, not fully comprehensive, it has to be said. 
But if we consider how much remains to be done, and for some environmental problems, just how little time is left, there is not only no room for complacency, there is actually cause for downright alarm. We've lost valuable time due to poor leadership. When I took over as EB Secretary General in 2011, we were halfway through the second term of the Barroso Commission that uh, Yanis Potochnik just referred to. And we were eagerly awaiting a new commission, naively floating ideas that were something like a European Green Deal, actually. After all, uh, we knew it couldn't be worse than Barroso. How wrong we were. Uh, Juncker, Juncker doubled down on the jobs and growth agenda and operationalized it through a system for filtering out any legislative proposals that did not serve the jobs and growth agenda. The only reason it was not more of a disaster for the environment was the good work of some of the committed services and a few commissioners, and of course Yanis Potochnik was one of those, and of course the pushback from a wide range of stakeholders, including member states, MEPs and NGOs, among others. Uh, and we think back and almost like a, a nightmare at the idea that the cornerstone of nature protection, the Birds and Habitats Directives, were being threatened with the axe uh, at that time. Uh, really extraordinary, and the circular economy package was actually withdrawn. The air pollution package was almost withdrawn, um, but was just kept. Um, so under Juncker, the process is ground on, trying to keep under the radar, radar but without the required urgency uh, or momentum. And then we had the Annus Horribilis of 2016, with the twin disasters of Brexit and Trump. Brexit, and I'm sure Petros would agree with me here, uh, was the biggest setback for the European project since its inception. We're inclined to forget how the UK was only one of several countries with strong Eurosceptic movements, but the particular flaws in the UK decision-making processes, both the specific setup of the referendum, but more generally a deeply unfair electoral system that creates artificial majorities, led to this result. Um, I sometimes wonder if the EU had had a European Green Deal at that moment and had had effective leadership communicating about that, uh, whether it could have made a difference. Um, I mean, the point was made in the previous discussion that, well, some European citizens are concerned about the European Green Deal um, because of the red tape argument, but the uh, successive opinion polls show that action by the EU on the environment is, is highly popular and that citizens actually want more action by the EU uh, on the environment. But then uh, when the chief communicator is somebody like Juncker, uh, who's deaf to that issue and is stuck in the 20th century jobs and growth paradigm, uh, it certainly wasn't helpful. But I've been, I've been wrong on my predictions on uh, you know, w what, did, what would happen and I'm even probably even wrong about what would have happened in a counterfactual situation. And yes, Peter, I know I still owe you a pint for losing the Brexit bet because I thought they wouldn't go through with it. Uh, I, I, will, I will pay my debts at some point. Um, yeah, so of course um, it, goes, it goes on with the law-breaking nationalist cult of Johnson continuing to distract and destroy with this week's outrage being the possibility of withdrawal from the human uh, the, the European Court of Human Rights being contemplated because its findings were inconvenient, that being raised. Um, so I, I do hope the UK will come back into the fold at some point, but it seems that things need to get worse before they can get better. But moving into some sort of happier times, um, finally three years later in 2019, we had the breakthrough, the green wave of the 2019 European Parliament elections, followed by the unveiling of the European Green Deal in in December 2019. The launch of the European Green Deal did not change things on the ground overnight. Uh, not at all. As you've heard during the day, the same battles still need to be fought. Some are won, some are lost, and most result in a compromise. But it has set a new direction of travel. In fact, the importance of the change in the high-level narrative cannot be overstated. Instead of environmental policies having to be filtered according to whether they contributed to the jobs and growth agenda under Juncker, we move towards a situation where this is more or less reversed 
through um, do no harm and do no significant harm principles being applied in certain areas. Um, and this doesn't mean um, that there's, no room for, there's any room for complacency, uh, as was shown very clearly by Patrick's presentation this morning. But the bigger room, the bigger reason that there's no room for complacency is because of the many signals that science is bringing us, as seen in Luke's presentation this morning, that time is running out. The most obvious examples of this are the inexorable creep towards 1.5 degree Celsius, the continuing biodiversity loss, including irreversible species extinction, and the contamination of nature and humans with toxic substances. So looking forward to the next 10 years, how can we do better? Well, a few points. We need to bridge the gap between systemic change and incremental change. There's a growing recognition among the usual suspects that we need systemic change, but even more broadly, beyond the usual suspects, um, there's less awareness of exactly what that will look like, uh, and even less on the concrete steps that we need to take to get there. And I believe we need to avoid the tendency to pit systemic change and incremental change against each other. In some cases, the accumulation of incremental changes will trigger or will add up to systemic change. There are, of course, cases where specific incremental changes can lock us into a technology that is better than the old one, but not as good as the one we need. Think of a, a leak-proof gas pipeline. Uh, think of a more inter efficient internal combustion engine that still runs on fossil fuels. And you need to look at those case by case. Um, and on this topic, if I can briefly dis uh, digress to express some pride in the way the EB does embrace the full spectrum from quite nerdy technical work, for example, on emission standards, whereby successfully advocating for lowering a threshold by a few milligrams per cubic meter, we can save some tens of thousands of lives in the next years, next 10 years, as well as, on the other hand, visionary work on the transition to a well-being economy. And I think these fit, for the most part, quite comfortably under this broad roof that we have. Another point is that I believe we need to avoid friendly fire. So often people who agree on 90% of a topic devote all their passion and resources to arguing about the 10% instead of trying to convince the rest of the world, the ones outside the tent, of the, uh, about the 90%. And linked to this, we need critical, nuanced thinking that allows us to recognise the differences between bad and very, very bad. I think of the ultra-progressives who share responsibility for giving us Trump by turn, not turning out to vote because they saw both candidates as not worthy of their vote. There's great strength in, in the diversity of the environmental movement. And when I talk about the environmental movement, I don't just think of the environmental NGOs. I think the movement's a lot broader than that. And I think of uh, the, the, the many civil servants working in, in uh, national ministries, in DG Environment or other ministries. Um, I think of the judiciary. I think of uh, the trade unions, where, who also have people who are working and on our issues from their different pieces on the chessboard. Um, and I think there is strength in that diversity. We need to appreciate it. Um, and, yeah, I mean, people have talked about policy coherence earlier. Uh, that's another thing we need to uh, obviously promote. There's not much uh, needs to be said about that. We also, I'm coming close to the end now, in case you're getting worried, that I was only halfway through. Uh, we need to be ready to discuss difficult topics, and one example is the population question. I'm really happy that we've started that discussion inside the EB, approaching it from a human rights perspective, particularly linking it with the empowerment of women and girls, and not allowing the topic to be monopolised by xenophobic or right, far-right forces, which it has been um, uh, up to now and in the past in particular. Um, we need to give more attention to the way that decisions are taken. So often the quality of decisions is directly related to the quality of the decision-making processes. Over the past decades, we made significant strides with the introduction of environmental impact assessment, strategic environmental impact assessment, the, the August rights, information, participation, justice. Uh, but as the EU's scandalous attempt to fra fra fragrantly violate the Oris Convention uh, by refusing to initially to revise the Oris Regulation. Uh, these are not battles that are won and then we move on. No, there's a need for ongoing vigilance 
to counter the apparently natural tendency of humans to monopolize power and use information control as, as, a, as a tool for that end. Um, and this, all, of course, links to the issue of rule of law. Um, and, and then I would also mention the issue of the, the wider Europe, uh, and that's been very much on our minds today, I think. And, you know, I mean, Jorgo was talking about the, the head, the heart, and the hand, and I think most conferences are very much about the head. I mean, that's where people come and they all sort of talk and talk and exchange ideas. I mean, for me, this conference, and maybe I have a unique perspective because it's my last, but, you know, I think it has, there has been a lot of heart uh, in, this, in this day. And I think Andre kind of set us off uh, with his, his extraordinary speech this morning, um, hot from Ukraine. Uh, but that wasn't the only moment. There were several moments in the day, I think, that were, were really spoken from the heart and were, were very moving. Um, but, yeah, I think that broader question of European solidarity is, is, really, is really key. And, you know, we, we definitely... I, I know the EB is kind of famous for focusing on the EU, but we've done that always looking one step beyond the EU, and that step has grown bigger and bigger, so that uh, Andre and his organization and others are full members of the EB from Ukraine, as we have members from Georgia and Moldova and so on. Um, and I, I think it's good if we keep that, that perspective. Um, and, well, almost finally, um, the, about the European project. And as you heard, the, the EB did nail its colours to the mast a few years ago when we decided to, to join the European movement. And I think we were sort of, we were wavering a bit because we didn't share the whole kind of federalist, you know, the, the more extreme uh, vision that some of the members of the European movement had. But we were assured that we didn't need to. And I think it was Brexit that kind of pushed us over the line and it was a time to declare, you know, you're either with us or you're against us. And, uh, and, and we decided it was, it was the right moment to do that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, coming to a conclusion, I mean, I think we are a long way from where we need to be. I'm not as pessimistic as you, Yorgo, in terms of the von der Leyen Commission. I, I do, and I do believe that narrative is useful, and I do believe it makes a difference, but I also agree that we absolutely can't take words at face value. We have to see it tra translate into concrete uh, actions. Um, because, yeah, we do need to act as if our house is on fire. We need to step up our efforts as if our very survival uh, depended on it, because it actually does. I mean, this is the issue of our century on which all other issues are predicated, because it does concern the survival of our civilization. So, um, yeah, with that rather sober note, I want to say that, you know, despite all the accounts of how bad things are and how threatening the world is, uh, I can only feel optimism in the present company. Um, so keep up the fight. I will be part of it from a different place. Thank you. very much Jeremy. The good thing is that it's still more, what is it, four hours or something before this place closed because now it's a reception and uh, it is also Jeremy's, or it is actually Jeremy's farewell party. So we still have some time to spend with you. Very fantastic person. So but before I invite you to the reception. Uh, there is one more very important thing, and that is I want to thank some people who has been involved in this conference. First of all, thank you who's been here, and thank to all of you being participating remotely. And thank you then very much, all of you has been part of the preparation of the conference. And I want to mention a few person in specifically and. That is Alessia, are you here? <laughs> Alessia? She's, she's probably organizing something. Okay. Alessia and also Martina. Stand here and tap dance. 
us or something. Um, Orla and uh, Andrea, Marie. in the back, uh, and the whole communications and IT team, all the EEB policy experts, who... <laughs> who have, uh, have prepared the breakout sessions and uh, the background papers and many more people who have been around making, making this day a success. So with that, welcome to Jeremy's farewell party. It's happening just there, I think, or there. Yeah. <laughs>